This broadcast is copywritten by the Sagu Sports Network for the private use of our audience. Any other use of the broadcast or any pictures, descriptions, or accounts of the game without the Sagu Sports Network consent is prohibited. Welcome to the Sagu Sports Network. We are live from Lumpkin Stadium here in Waxahachie, Texas. I'm Adam Ferguson, joined by my broadcast partner, as always, Tim Roberts. Tim. It feels like it's football weather. I, I know. After two games, you know, in the <laughs> mid '90s, it's it's crisp. There's a breeze. It's in the '60s. I, it's perfect. A perfect Saturday afternoon for football. We have got a good one in store for you. You've got your Iron Bowls. You've got your backyard brawls. And now it's the collegiate battle of Highway 287 here as the Texas Wesleyan Rams from Fort Worth travel about 30-ish minutes down south here to Waxahachie to take on the Sagu Lions. We're going to get into that in here in just a little bit, Tim. But let's look on the broader scale, the NAIA Top 25 from the last week, starting off with number 24, Georgetown, beating upsetting number six Bethel. This is a big one. Tim. And it was upset central. We'll get into all of yeah. them, but it was a crazy week in the NAIA. Uh, they were led by Darius Neal, who had 180 yards uh, rushing with three touchdowns. Georgetown had actually lost the week before to Reinhardt, so they bounced back in a big way by taking down number six Bethel. A, a lot of races got upended last week. And that was not a close game. When you talk no. about upsets, maybe 30 to 27, yeah. that was 52 to 25. That's a blowout upset. And it was never close. Never they, close. They, it wasn't like that got put up on the scoreboard late. They dominated the whole way. So you like points, 52-24. We'll move <laughs> on to our next one. Midland upset, another upset, number 10 Dort in a high-scoring affair of 10-7. to 10-7, to seven, <laughs> a good old-fashioned college football score. And they, and they were led by running back Tyler Denkert with 125 yards rushing. Midland had actually lost three games in a row going into that one. Now, two of those losses were to Morningside and Northwestern, two we of know the those. best in the yeah, NAIA. Yeah. Uh, but that completely upends that KCAC race by throwing uh, number 10 Dort for 
for that 10 to 7 loss. I, I, I kind of love low scoring affairs. You like, like those? That. I, uh, you know, no, 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 no. Uh, you, know, you, know, you, you need all kinds. You need your 52 <laughs> to 45, and you need your 10 to 7 to make it a full, well rounded weekend. And then we've got one of my favorite rivalries, the rivalry that is separated by just one letter. Yes. Cumberland upsets Cumberlands 21 17. We thought it's confusing to have the Langston Lions playing the Sagu <laughs> Lions. I don't even want to imagine Cumberland versus Cumberlands. Uh, you know, that's, that's a. a Big thing for Cumberland because their schedule gets much tougher after they win 21-17. Yeah. Three of the next four games are against top 15 opponents. And we do want to note a little bit of historical irony. Cumberland plays Cumberlands on the 107th anniversary of the famous 222 to nothing Georgia Tech win over Cumberland. That's not a that's that, not a type. There's not that, an extra digit in there anywhere. That, that, that is the most the <laughs> most lopsided game in college football history. Crazy. 222 to zero. Look it up. A story behind that's actually fantastic. But yeah, Cumberland plays Cumberlands on that anniversary. A little bit of historical irony, and Cumberland gets the win. So Look at I that. Like that. Look at that. Absolutely. <laughs> Moving on. Number three, 23 Montana Western. Another upset over Montana Tech. Another rivalry game yeah. and another. High scoring affair. Yeah, and then they were led a lot of running backs in this in this week. 102 yards yep. led by running back Pete Gibson, as well as their quarterback threw for 224 <clears throat> yards touchdown. That's Michael Palandri. Montana Western is kind of a sneaky team there at number 23. Their only loss of the year was to College of Idaho. Yeah, and that was on yep. a 25 yard hail mary as time expired. So that is how close they are to being undefeated. So look out for Montana Western now sneaking into that top 20 conversation. And we talk about that top 20. The top 25 are eligible for the playoffs, but you really want to be in that top 20 to get that uh, to get that bid into the playoff system. Yeah. And then lastly, another upset. Southern Oregon upsets number 25 Rocky Mountain. Odd score, 23 to 5. So there's a safety somewhere in there, but yeah. again, another upset. <laughs> and I love, I, again, I love 10 sevens, and I love crooked scores too. 23 <laughs> to 5 right there. Southern Oregon actually threw three picks in that game. So they had to overcome a lot, but it gets pretty interesting for them. And for us, uh, they face an old nemesis this week against yep. Arizona Christian. We know uh, them. Yeah, we know so, them. so we'll yep. get into that, that race a little bit more over there in that conference where things are getting very tricky coming into this week. Absolutely. Now, we talked about last week. Now, we got to look ahead to this week now. We can't make we can't predict the future, but there's a lot of big matchups this week I across the NAIA. First one being number 12, Montana Western, taking on Rocky Mountain. Again, Rocky Mountain receiving votes. Yeah, and so that's going to be a big battle in the frontiers. We just talked about with Montana Western getting that win last week. It's going to kind of be the determining point of who's going to win that very self-cannibalizing conference up there in the frontier. People always knock each other off. And then, what I, in my opinion, game of the week, number five, Marion, 5-0 five versus number 11, Concordia, 5-0. You, there's another game we're going to talk about here in a second that is also closely ranked. But you got two top 15 teams. That's going to be a good one. Yeah, two undefeated teams. And Marion, they've been on a hot streak. They have scored 40-plus in four of their five games this year. This could really determine who gets that Mid-States, Midwest, uh, I'm sorry, Mid-East yes. auto bid because yep. they're split into two, the Midwest and the Mid-East, and both sides champion gets an auto bid. So, I mean, a playoff implications of uh, Galore! I would like to one. see both sides champion play <laughs> each other for the conference championship, but that's just, I guess it's a little old fashioned. Uh, we're moving on. Number 20, Baker, 4 and 1, taking on number 25, Man U, Mid America, Nazarene, right there in that top 25, another closely contested matchup. And another one where the winner takes contr control of the South Division there yep. in the heart of America. Uh, Baker, their only loss of the year to number two, Grandview. So another team with one loss against a very top ranked team. Meanwhile, Mid America, Nazarene. A lot of faces yeah. Sagu fans yep. would recognize up there. Uh, their former offensive coordinator, Paul Hansen, is the head coach. Former Sagu Hall of Fame quarterback, C.J. Collins, yeah. is uh, the quarterback's coach, as well as Vanique Benton is the uh, special teams and DB's coach. So Mid-America Nazarene uh, got, got a big Sagu connection right there in the middle of the country. Absolutely. And the last matchup we're keeping an eye on that we'll give you score updates throughout the day. Yeah. Uh, number three, Morningside, a name that we're familiar with. Not familiar with them being number three, necessarily. No, we're no. used to seeing them number one. But number three, Morningside 5-0 at Dakota Wesleyan, who is receiving votes. And Morningside, same story as always. They've won four straight games gains by 30 plus points yeah. Dakota Wesley is receiving those votes their four game win streak they've won by a combined 16 points so oh. <laughs> so it's number three versus yeah. receiving votes but there's a bit of a gap there and Morningside is going to be able to show how big of a gap that is well we talked about the weather it's a little cooler up here yeah. at the top of the stadium but let's go down to the field report with Kiara D'Amato Kiara down to you 
We are looking for a great day of fall football today. Today in Waxahachie, there was a historic solar eclipse with only 81% coverage, but it had no effect on today's weather. The past two home games Sagu has had have been in the mid 90s, but today it has cooled down to just 70 degrees. It could not be more perfect. Today, there is some wind. As you can see, it's looking to be up to 15 miles an hour, so it could have an impact, positive or negative, on Sagu's kicking and passing game. Last week, we had an amazing kickoff return for a touchdown by Dylan Alford, and today, that wind could impact the possibility of that. That's all I have for you right now. Back to you, Adam. Thank you, Kiara. Well said. Now, we talked about the NAIA last week and this week. Let's scale it back a little bit, talk about the Sooner Athletic Conference. Tim, this past week across the sack was not very closely contested. No, no. it was very clear who the winners yeah, were. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about North American, the new team vying for a conference kind of in that probationary period at Louisiana Christian. High, f quickly rising Louisiana Christian 56 to nothing 56 to nothing catching the attention of everybody how about this for a stat lines Louisiana Christian ran in that game 72 times wow 72 runs for 404 <laughs> yards so the clock stayed moving and yes. that is that is a recipe for disaster for a lot of teams in the sooner as they are quickly becoming a name to look out for to take the sooner crown and to potentially go a little bit further. They have put it together out there. And, of course, we will see North American here next week on the Sagu Sports Network. Uh, OPSU Oklahoma Panhandle losing to Langston, who we saw here a couple of weeks ago, 33-3, to another blowout game. And two pick sixes for Langston. Yep. We saw that fearsome pass defense. It came alive last week with that big 30-point win. Langston moving up the charts as well. They're, they're, they're looking, looking like they have a chance to be on that outside, that outside spectrum if yep. you get some teams to get knocked off. And then, of course, Texas, Texas College at Arkansas Baptist, what turned out to be the lowest scoring game of the weekend, 23-8, uh, Texas College losing to Arkansas Baptist. That's a tough one for Texas College. You know, yep. They kind of looked at you know, some of these games that they should have won, and they've already lost to North American, and now they've lost to Arkansas Baptist. Uh, they're going to have a tough hill to climb if they want to get that win for the year. And then, of course, Sagu completing the comeback last yeah. week against Wayland Baptist, down 16 nothing at halftime, and that score ends up being 37-16. to yeah. Looks quite lopsided. Yeah, it looks quite lopsided, and it was because of the special teams, a lot of turnovers. Uh, and they had a pick six, a kickoff return for a touchdown. Dekevion Rose had three rushing touchdowns, all from just a few yards out, thanks to the special teams, to the defense. And really, the most bizarre thing was Wayland Baptist had more penalty yards than Sagu had total yards. Yeah, yeah. So the offense was not clicking for the most of the game, but they came alive in a big way. As you see that one of those big kickoff returns right here. Dylan Alford, 37 yeah. unanswered points for the big win to take off that two-game losing streak they were on. I talked to Coach about that a little bit. We'll hear from him in a minute about how that, how that, that came about. But, yeah, good to get off that losing streak into a big one here against the Rams who are coming off a bye. Yeah, and they're not ready. Just, not just coming off a yep. bye, but two weeks ago they beat Arkansas Baptist 62 to nothing. So, dare I say it, they're coming off of two byes. <laughs> it's, it's tough to call any game you play in your Sooner Athletic Conference a bye, but – essentially coming off two buys. At least six quarters worth of knowing <laughs> they, 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 they've had things To prepare for up. Sagu yeah. on the road trip to Waxahachie. Absolutely. So we talked about last week. Let's talk about this week. It's, it's maybe here more of the same this week. Yeah. A lot of um, lopsided matchups here in the Sooner. We'll start with number 13, 13 Louisiana Christian at Texas College. Texas College desperately needing a win. I'm going to go with Louisiana Christian. They jumped up in the polls to number 13, one of the highest ratings that a Sooner Athletic Conference team has ever had at this point in the season have looked very impressive. Yeah, and they've looked so good. I don't think there's any question who we're taking in that one. They've, they've been solid now for a full calendar year. Uh, really since that loss against the Lions here to kick off their yeah. season, they've been looking really, really good. Absolutely. Then Langston at North American at 7 o'clock tonight. I'm going Langston in this one. North American still trying to find its its place here in the potential Sooner Athletic Conference. Yeah, not much tough one on here. Langston uh, definitely the best team in that one. And then we're moving on to Arkansas Baptist at number 18 Ottawa, another team in that top 20 looking for a playoff spot 7 p.m. that's in Arizona surprise Arizona I'm going Ottawa we've seen this team we know what they're about yeah we know what they're about another one that should be pretty easy and done pretty quick and then of course the game coming up here on the Sagu Sports Network at 2 o'clock number 21 Texas Wesleyan at Sagu Tim you know how we feel about Texas Wesleyan they just breed winning sports championship 
programs. I'm going Texas Wesleyan as much as it might pain me to say as a Sagu guy, Texas Wesleyan takes the win today in Waxahachie. Got to go the same. Kind of all chalk this week. Uh, yeah. You know, no, no, no deviating from that. So definitely picking the Rams in this one. Just got to see if Sagu can find a way to get some of those big plays they got last week to hang in there and maybe just try to pull off the upset. Don't go anywhere. We're going to hear from Coach Ellis here in just a minute as well as talking about keys of the game and players to watch right here on the Sagu Sports Network. When you trust someone with your money, you're part of something greater than yourself. You're investing in a principle that it takes individuals to create a community, that we are stronger when we support each other, that at some point, everyone will need a helping hand, that a meaningful purpose can be found in a calling. At AGC, we're banking with a purpose so you can live for yours. Racing Canes, we're huge football fans, but we're also fans of your local fundraisers and fun runs, small victories, and big ideas. And yes, even the neighborhood animal shelter. I was getting to that. Plus over 30,000 other partners in the communities we serve. When you order our hand-battered chicken fingers, craveable cane sauce, and jugs of freshly made tea and lemonade to cheer on your home team, you're also supporting your hometown. Raising Canes Chicken Fingers, one love. <laughs> Welcome back to the Sagu Sports Network. Tim, Texas Wesleyan coming in today. They got to feel pretty confident, but walk me through what they have to do today to walk with, uh, walk away with a win. Yeah, let's go over their keys to the game. First, don't even let an inch happen through the air. Uh, they are number 10 in passing yards allowed per game at 150. In the modern football spectrum, to hold teams consistently that low is fantastic. They're also tied for 12th in interceptions on the air with nine. We know how Sagu was struggling through the air. Just shut it down. Just don't even make it an option from the first snap of the game. Second, Go ahead and just run. Hand that ball off. Grind this game down. They're averaging over 200 yards a game on the ground throughout the season. So, I mean, just find a way to keep on keep that clock moving. Don't let anything happen. Third, if you're looking for any weaknesses on this Rams team, they've got to get better in clutch time. What I mean by that is that they have two weaknesses. Their third down rate is pedestrian. They only convert 34% of the third downs, and their red zone scoring rate is actually just bad. 64%. That's not touchdowns. That's overall scoring in the red zone. When you're wanting to contend in the playoffs, those are two areas that you've got to get better at. And if you're drawing a blueprint for how you maybe let a team stay in the game, if you're getting off the field because you're not converting third downs or you're not making those drives count for points inside the red zone, that's how you can get in trouble. So that's the two areas to watch where they need to improve upon. Texas Wesleyan looking to stay undefeated in conference, moving to 5-0. and oh. Moving over to the other side of the field, Sagu, keys to the game here. Look, first one, keep it close. We know what Texas Wesleyan is. They're a ranked team coming in against a Sagu team that is struggling a little bit. Texas Wesleyan is loaded, and it seems like they have no weaknesses on offense in terms of between the 20s. No weaknesses on offense. If you can keep it close, it allows you to keep the game where you want it to be to set up maybe the second key here, and that is create a splash play. Last week, down at half, down two scores, pick six, kick return for a touchdown. It sparked the comeback, and it ended up making that score seem a little lopsided in a game that was closer than anyone looking at the final score would think. If you can go, you, you, I'm not sure you can go blow for blow with the Rams. I'm not sure you can keep up with them offensively, but if you keep the game close, bide your time, wait for a mistake, those splash plays won you the game last week. So just go ahead and keep an eye out for it. And lastly, you talked about it. Don't let them run all over you. Texas Wesleyan, 200 yards rushing a game, two guys averaging seven, over seven a carry. That's a first down every two yards, or every two carries. And it's the math is the math. It's, it, the numbers add up. If you can get physical, control the trenches, and take away one thing that Texas Wesleyan does extremely well, very difficult to do. But if you can take that away, you might have a good chance at, at walking away with an upset win today. So, In, in a way, somebody's almost got to be a hero today. Yeah. Usually you tell guys not to play hero ball, take that fair catch if you need it. You might have to be a little risky today and try to go be a hero. Now, Tim, you caught up with head coach Greg Ellis. Let's hear what Coach Ellis had to say. All right, Coach, so let's flash back to last week. Team's on a two-game losing streak. You're down 13 nothing midway through the third quarter, and then just you flip a switch, you go nuts, 37 points. What was the mindset of the team? How did you guys pull that off? You know, the biggest thing that um, 
our guys did. They stuck together. And so that's not always easy to do when things aren't going your way. That's something that we harp on, but it doesn't always get accomplished, if you would. And so my hat comes off to our guys, to our coaching staff for sticking together and um, figuring out a couple different things. Um, some guys stepped up and made some good plays for us, obviously. And so that's the key, man, sticking together. Now, no mystery about who's in town today. Texas Wesleyan, one of the best teams in the conference. Uh, well, what's the key? What was the one thing that you focus on the most in practice week on, on slowing down Texas Wesleyan? Well, I correct you. They're one of the best teams in the country, not just in our conference. <laughs> and so, and, and that's a good word to say, how do we slow them down? You know, and so it's going to be hard. Um, they are a well-balanced team. You know, you wish you had a team that's committed to throwing the ball um, or committed to running the ball, you know, um, or committed to playing an even front defense or odd front defense defense, but they're kind of all over the board, uh, which is, um, you know, good for them. They're doing a good job over there. And so we're going to put our best foot forward, man. And, um, you know, we worked on a couple of different things. And so we'll see here in a couple of minutes. How, how did it um, work out for us? Coach, thanks so much. Good luck out there today. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's awesome. It's, it's always good to see you catch up with Coach Ellis. So let's go over quickly some of these players who are going to be executing the keys that we talked about earlier. Let's start with the Rams, Tim. Walk me through some. You know what? We've seen a lot of teams this year that spread the ball around. Not the case with the Rams. First guy, Ernest Caesar, running back. He has 112 yards per game on the ground, plus four touchdowns. Plus, he's averaging 34 receiving yards a game and has two receiving touchdowns. He is the go-to guy on the ground. Then, through the air, wide receiver A.J. Bob, 123 yards per game, seven touchdowns, 21 yards a reception. So, I mean, just the go-to guy through the air. And last, I got to go give a defensive guy some prop. Defensive lineman Kobe <laughs> Adams, three and a half sacks on the year, five and a half tackles for a loss, 23 total tackles, leads the team in all those categories. Just a fearsome force right there. And on the Sagu side, DeKevian Rose had three touchdowns last week. Short yardage beast. Get the ball inside the five-yard line, let him go to work. Jamal Long has been playing angry, throwing stiff arms, one-handed grabs, which have been absolutely incredible. He's been a treat to watch. Kind of that hybrid tight end receiver with that big body being 6'5". Keep an eye on him. And then Jay Mosley and Lontarius McLean kind of cheated a little bit. Your outside corners, if you need splash plays, these guys have been good. Pick sixes, interceptions, look for these guys to make a make a play on the ball. We're going to go down to the we're going to go down to the sideline for the uh, finishing of the national anthem, the prayer and the opening coin toss to see who gets to kick us off here in Waxahachie. Don't go anywhere. Rams versus Lions right here on the Sagu Sports Network. As we head out here to see the coin toss, the wind on the screen, so this is going to be a, or I'm sorry, the wind in the stadium moving from the left to the right of your screen will determine kind of who gets to have the advantage here to start the game. I was watching warm-ups, uh, Tim, and the Texas Wesleyan kicking unit was attempting field goals from 60, 60 plus. Um, they nailed a couple, a couple wide left, right, as it tends to be when you're trying to get that much on it. Um, but it's definitely going to play a factor in today's game. Yeah, if the wind's at your back, I'd say go for it for sure. <laughs> but yeah, you can see a lot of that. And that's when we talk about that, that, that ground offense. 
you don't have to go through the airs. You see the coin toss here. Rams win the toss. They So the Rams will kick off with the wind at their back. And Sagu will start with the ball. So the first test of this Sagu offense who, I mean, even last week, you see 37 points on the board and you say, oh, good, they might have got something going. <laughs> they can thank their defense and special teams for that. They're Absolutely. still really, really yep. looking for that foot yep. in the ground to get going. Reminder, uh, you know, you can pull this up on your television at home. Watch it on the big screen. Uh, keep your phone out. Uh, drop us notes in the chat. Say hi. Give us pics. Uh, give us insight. Whatever you got, let us know when you're, where you're watching from. Uh, we try to keep track of who's watching from furthest away. I, well, what's the winner so far? I think we had somebody from Papua New Guinea earlier this it, year. It's so that's, been crazy. The winner. Never, uh, <laughs> never would have guessed some of the locations that we've gotten people from. I was like, I was thinking, oh, you know, Hawaii, you know, yeah. the United States still. <laughs> but no, we're getting other countries in here, and it's awesome. It, it is cool to see. It truly is a global broadcast. As we are ready here, as Texas Wesleyan will line up to kick it off, Garrett Bolgett to do the kicking duties, and it's you see the effect of the winds there as that lands out of the back of the end zone. So quite a boot there from Bolget. And Sagu will take over at the 25-yard line. And Briley Green will be the one to lead the team onto the field. Uh, in both of our home games we've covered this year, uh, Jamonte Gordon-West got the start, but Briley Green took over midway through the game. Uh, he did not finish the game against Ottawa, Arizona, but did finish against Langston. Again, just trying to find that traction on offense to move forward, find, find a way to make success happen. First and 10, here is Green. Sends Dakivian Rose in motion. Empty backfield now. Back to pass, Wesleyan brings pressure. Texas Wesleyan brings, he's gonna go deep here, looking for his man down the sideline. Alford, underthrown, incomplete. Texas Wesleyan brought, it looked like six on that on that first down play. Brought six, and I will say that Sagu offensive line was able to buy some time for Bradley Green there. Might have missed a face mask, honestly, there on the side corner, uh, right as it came in there. Uh, ball was underthrown there for Dylan Alford, and it wouldn't have mattered if he was stepped out, stepped out of bounds anyway. So. Dylan Alford had that kickoff return for a touchdown last week against Wayland Baptist. Here's second and 10. They will turn around and hand it off to Rose. Rose looking to bounce it outside. Texas Wesleyan doing a good job stringing that out, bringing him down for a five-yard loss, and that brings up third and 15. Not an ideal start here if you're Sagu. Now, you've got to have success in the trenches if you want to go around the corner like that. You've got to be able to block win your assignments. Sagu struggled with, at that most of this year and the Rams are a team that is going to have the speed to beat you to those corners. And so it brings up third and very long here on the opening drive. Third and 14. They give him a loss of four. He sends a man in motion. That is Paul Odidi in the slot. Here's Green. Back to pass on third down. Letting it across the middle of the field. He's got Odidi. Odidi brought down just three yards past that original line of scrimmage. Picked up... Eight yards there on third down, but it'll bring up fourth and seven in the punting unit out for Sagu. That is the way I would like to see the Lions use ODD more. Obviously, he excels on fade routes on the corner because he uses that giant six foot five frame to go up and get the ball, but he has also been very good out of the slot, catching those slant patterns. He can still use that frame as well to block out. So he's able to get some of your yards back there, but when you're looking at fourth and 13, there's not a whole lot you can do. On to punt is Ryan Lewis. The Phenomenal young sophomore punter gets it down to the 45-yard line, and that's where Texas Wesleyan will take over. Definitely noticed the wind in that situation. Uh, with how quick he got that got batted down. You're going to see him get usually a lot more yardage. So now leading out the Rams offense, Carson Rogers didn't talk about him pregame. Usually uh, the quarterback's going to be a key player. I just uh, you know saw too much out of the running back and wide receiver. So he got bumped, but he's having a, another, a solid year. The red shirt sophomore leading the team. So When's the last over. time that you and I didn't have a quarterback in our players? I, I know. Either team. I, you know, I've always got to throw a defensive guy in there, so <laughs> nothing against uh, Carson Rogers at all. They will hand it off here on first down, looking to bounce the outside, trying to make a man miss. Good job on that outer 
edge to limit the damage to just two yards. That was Lontarius McLean doing a good job of sticking with Ernest Caesar. Yeah, he's going to get stiff armed right here, but doesn't ever let the stiff arm create the separation that's needed for it to work. It was a good job. Like I said, minimizing the damage, just a two yard gain on first down. Ernest Caesar coming in at 5'6", 165. Really a true burner in the backfield. Very fast. Second and eight here for the Rams. They will hand it off to Caesar again. Caesar trying to be patient, find something, nothing working there. Sagu shutting down the run here. Back to back plays, brings up third and 12. And another time that they just sort of dominated the front line there. No push allowed at all. They stay at home, nobody overcommits. And a solid job by Keith Hargraves getting blocked to fight through and be the one to make that tackle. Throw him for a four yard loss. So it's third and 12. See if Sagu's defense can match three and outs here with Texas Wesleyan. Third and 12 incoming here as Rogers in the shotgun. He's got three to his right. One man in the backfield. He is back to pass here on third down. Sagu brings pressure up there. He gets hit as before he throws and down he goes. A sack for the Sagu defense. And they will indeed get off the field matching the three and out from Texas Wesleyan. A excellent drawn up blitz here overwhelms the line and then they did a good job of coverage downfield he didn't have anywhere to go quickly and that allows for the pressure so how about that for the sagu defense coming up real big daniel trejo on to punt here for texas wesleyan daniel trejo a name a lot of people will know from around here for sure and look at the wind take this punt back down to the 11 yard line but has room to make something happen here he gets brought down was looking to find a crease and just barely brought down from behind was isaac gowdy but yeah daniel trejo uh, had been the punter and kicker here at texas wesleyan for a while and then ended up moving on to the university of texas was the longhorns punter last year uh Wanted to go pro, couldn't find his opportunity, had another year of eligibility. So he comes back now to Texas Wesleyan as a grad student uh, to punt some more and look for that next opportunity. There you see some of the score updates we had talked about earlier. We'll get into those as the day progresses. But here, first and 10 from the 18, they will pitch it out to Rose. Rose Ooh. met immediately, nothing working there. It looked like four Rams defenders in the backfield immediately brings down a lot, a huge loss. Sir Hill is going to be the one he goes unblocked. Somebody's got to check him there. He just goes right by his man. Don't know if he thought he had another guy behind him to finish it off. But an eight-yard loss on first down. Second and 18. Sagu with their backs up against the wall. Two wide, kind of tight formation here for Green. 12 personnel. Since a man and almost two yeah, men in motion. Al almost, had a, almost had a, and, and you're going to have a flag here regardless. Looks like it's going to be an illegal formation. Yeah, that yeah. was all kind of busted from the beginning. There. Yeah, you almost had a, a false start with two men going in motion at the same time, and I don't think he got reset after the motion. Uh, they may choose to decline this, though, uh, after the yeah, penalty. Shift. Number seven and five both moving at the same time and didn't come set. That penalty will be declined. Third down. See, now I'm not sure that's the right call because Alford did get set right after he I, had moved. He was set. I'm, I, not I don't sure. know. I, I'm not sure if he got back up on the line. He had it should have been a false start. Yeah, the false start is probably more count. accurate. But regardless, uh, they, they'll decline it and bring up third and 18. Sagu with two third downs in this game and both third and a mile. Third and 18 incoming. He sends Rose in motion. Green back to pass. Let's it go across the middle, deep, looking for a man, almost intercepted, just over the head of that man in the middle, Joe Thomas. Falls incomplete, brings up fourth and 18, and the punting unit back out again here for Sagu. And Briley Green, oh my goodness, got rocked on that throw. He had to go pick up his hat after that, blew his helmet off, and I think he might have saw the pressure coming, threw it to a spot on the grass, and nobody was there. You see this replay here, absolutely crushed. And yeah, his helmet ended up around the goal line after that hit. Ryan Lewis on the punt again, his heels on the A in the end zone. Oh. It's blocked and it's into the end zone. Live ball and that's going to be a Wesleyan touchdown. First score of the game is a blocked punt into the end zone and Texas Wesleyan pending this extra point will go up 7-0 and an exciting play to kick off the scoring here in Waxahachie. We have actually seen this 
be an issue for the Lions. It has never come to fruition. We have seen a lot of pressure coming to Ryan Lewis, and this time absolutely untouched. Trying to see who actually made that hit, who was able to couldn't see from that angle. I could tell he was shaken up after the play. You saw him actually collapse into the end zone. I think he took that punt straight into the gut. Whenever, yeah, whenever you, uh, you're rushing the punt, you don't care what party it hits it. And unfortunately for, for that individual, right in the gut, and that, that can't feel good. It cannot feel good. No, nope, but it feels good to go up 7 nothing less than four minutes into this one. And you, you talked about needing to get big splash plays if you're the Lions. Well, the worst case scenario is that you're the one giving up the splash play. We'll be able, let me see who it is here. Is, yeah, right into the gut, into the end zone. We'll catch a number here finally. There's the there's number a number. <laughs> Hard to tell. It looks like Num number, number 16, 16 got the punt block. That would be Jay Reed, Jay junior Reed. defensive back. And that is tough. You're, you're, you're rushing. I don't think you ever plan on your midsection being no, the, par the that, part that gets the ball. You're used to seeing a hand get on it. Exactly. That, that's how much pressure got in. So you look at the live score updates, those big matches we talked about. Marion is ahead of Concordia by a touchdown. Game Happened of the, the week. Fourth, and the fourth quarter is dwindling. So big moments there. Mid-America Nazarene losing by 13 to Baker to start of the second. And we'll have another touchback here as it goes halfway into the end zone and Sagu will take a knee. Dylan Alford will take a knee. So Sagu comes back out here just on offense. And now we got a flag here after the play. This is this is a late flag. So this is gonna be something on a, a dead ball foul here. I wonder what they're gonna get here. I didn't see anything too crazy happen. I saw Justin Campbell holding his hands up. Uh, usually that means uh, not me, wasn't me. We'll see if he's correct <laughs> or not. After the play, that's sportsman like Honda, number 23 of the return team. After this to the goal, it'll be first down. That's number 23, that's first and sportsman like Honda. Ronnie. The second will retract, will be result in disqualification. <clears throat> That is, yeah, Ronnie Murphy. Ronnie Murphy will get called for the, well, not the 15-yard penalty, but a 12-and-a-half-yard penalty. A mental mistake you simply can't have when when the only a bright side was you're going to have typical field position. Instead, you're pinned inside your 15 already uh, with an offense that has yet to find its traction. Here is Green on first and 10. He is back to pass, looking deep down the sideline, long and well underthrown. And you have maybe a little bit of the wind fact there. It might have caught it. It looked like it came off of Green's hand awkwardly and was kind of a duck. Didn't quite get there. Yeah, you, that, that came out. That's, that's not the wind right there. That one slipped out of his hand as he threw it. Uh, had that been on target, he probably does have a, a first down. Second and 10, send a whole lot of men in motion here. Jamal Long now at the top of your screen. Talked about him pregame, the big target for Green and this quarterback crew. Back to pass is Green. Let's go across the middle, in and out of the hands of Paul Odidi and falls to the turf, incomplete. Zagu really struggling to get going here on offense. Brings up third and 10. And that's the route you're looking for with Odidi when he runs over the middle there. He has a little separation. You know, he's, he's facing back towards you, but could not haul it in and third and 10 for the Lions. Four wide here for Green on third and long. Back to pass, deep drop, he rolls out. He's gonna get hit, brought down at the one yard line. This Texas Wesleyan defense has come to play here in Waxahachie. Brings up another fourth down and this one even scarier as Ryan Lewis's heels will be on the edge of the back of his own end zone. And that's not a coverage sack completely because it hadn't quite gone on long enough, but there was nowhere for Briley Green to go with that ball before the pressure completely descended on him and there was nowhere for him to escape to. And he pretty much had to give up or else it would have been a safety. Has to get it away quickly and he does. It's a spiraling punt, but it's gonna be a short one. Hits at the 25 and fortunately for Sagu, 
takes a 10-yard roll, will be downed at the 35-yard line. And this is about as big of a nightmare of a start as you could have for Sagu as Texas Wesleyan sets up in very good field position. Yeah, I mean, when, when you're struggling on offense like this, to have a special teams touchdown go against you, and then you, you know you have that sack there to where now your defense, who's only been on the field once, you know, they've they they stood up very strong on their first drive, got a sack and a three and out. But the second time they hit the field, they're down seven nothing without having been on the field and have a 35 yard field behind them to defend. Uh, it's a tough place to be. First and ten, back to pass. Rogers has time. Floats to his left, lets it go across the middle, incomplete, Ooh. almost intercepted. Kind of tipped away and landed in the lap for a second of Xavier Garcia, but could not bring it in. And Garcia knew he should have had that one, but excellent coverage downfield. Pass was broken up by Lontarius McLean. He had pressure coming at him from the right. So could have been a lot more had the ball tipped probably a little bit higher. It's kind of hard when it hits you, you know, you know, square around your waistband. If you can go up more towards your chest, that's an easy pick to make. Second and ten here for the Rams. They'll hand it off here on second down, looking for a crease. Bounces it to the outside, throws a stiff arm again, and Caesar has a nice little five-yard gain there on second down. That brings up third and five. Good job of weaving through traffic. It's about creating those layers. See the, the block off the line of scrimmage by the tight end there creates enough of a layer for him to get going. Good recovery by the Sagu secondary to get there quick enough that, that nothing worse happens and does bring up another third down, third and five. And we, you talked about the field goal situation. The wind would be at their back right now, so uh, it yep. would be very interesting if, if this were to hold what their decision-making process would be. Five wide here for Carson Rogers. Empty backfield on third and five. Rogers back to pass, looking to the outside. It falls incomplete short of his intended receiver. That'll bring up fourth and five, and it looks like the field goal unit will trot out here for a 47-yard attempt. And that's one that Rodgers needs to do a little bit better at. The pressure was not around. As a matter of fact, it looks like it had caved completely behind him. He probably could have scrambled to pick up that first down. He needed to know he had enough time to actually deliver that strike on time. Got the wind at his back. Here is... Garrett Bogut, 47 yard attempt is up and it, it looks like it is good. That was good by plenty, right down the middle, had well enough on it. And Texas Wesleyan will go up 10 to nothing on the back of a 47 yard field goal again by Garrett Bogut. It's not gonna be very often uh, as a football team that you're gonna have a 10 to nothing lead and you don't have a first down in the game yet. <laughs> That's a charmed True. existence yep. right there. We've got action here in the Student Athletic mm -hmm. Conference today, Tim. A lot of Mac U. Yeah, about to say, it's you Lady Lions Volleyball, number 24 in the nation. They are looking, trying to finish off the sweep against Mac U. Meanwhile, over at the pitch, it's the number one men's team in the country taking on Sagu uh, with the Mac U Evangels, with the women at six o'clock. We'll have more for you about the spectacular things happening with the Sagu soccer program at the moment. So, hey, yeah. They get a new field and all of a sudden the play turns around. How about <laughs> that, huh, Tim? Hey, you know what? You, you, show, you show some uh, recruits that field. They want to come play there for sure. Absolutely. Texas Wesleyan to kick off here. Under 10 to play in the first quarter. Sporting a 10 to nothing lead. Again, blocked punt touchdown. Put them up 7 nothing, and they just had a 47-yard field goal. How about that? Man, he's booming it through the back of the end zone. Another touchback. So Sagu will take over on the 25-yard line for consecutive three consecutive three and outs. Of course, one of them resulting in the blocked punt for a touchdown. Yeah. Got to get moving here on offense. It's been an all-special teams game so far. So we have the live look in there. Ooh, looks. see, that's fall to me right there. The that rain. looks chilly. That looks yep. rainy. Uh, I, I see brown foliage in the background as the Concordia Cardinals are trailing the Knights. They're at home. They're about to get the ball at their own 15. Their sidelines hyped up. We'll keep you posted on that one. First down here. Green back to pass. Looking across the middle of the field. Looks for his man. Could not complete it. And ball intended for Zach Fuller. Good coverage that time by ja that middle linebacker. Javari Sanders is going to be the one to break it up. No separation. Does that perfect job of getting his arm around quick enough to bat it away. Finding that space to operate has been such a challenge for these Sagu receivers. Second and 10. 
Incoming here for Sagu. Four wide here for Briley Green. Rose in the backfield. Green, back to pass, taking a deep shot, looking down the side, looking for Long. Long brings it in, down at the 50. How about that catch from Jamal Long? Sometimes, Tim, to get something going, you just got to throw it up to your big guy, 6'5", Jamal Long. And Bradley Green has his options here, a perfectly paced, placed pass right over the head of the defender, Jay Reed, gets you to midfield. And for either team, that's the first offensive play of any sort of the game. Exactly what the Lions needed to try to get going. Yeah, just give it to your big guys. Let yeah. your big guys go make yep. plays. First and 10 from the 50. Here is Green. Back to pass on first down. Pumped and then met in the backfield. That's going to be a sack for Texas Wesleyan. First win there looked like it was Daniel Agbogan for the sack. And that'll bring up second and 18. He's going to get the credit for the sack, but it's Jose Bonilla who splits the A gap and throws Briley Green off of his feet to drop into the easy kind of wrap-up sack right there. Either way, complete dominance up front by the Rams to get that big sack. Second and 18 incoming here for Sagu. Four wide for Briley Green. They remain in this pistol formation. They get the play from the sideline. Play clock running down under five. Green will get the snap off. Quick hitter to the outside. Looks like a little bit of miscommunication there as looked like Long was running the slant. Green wanted to throw it back shoulder again down that sideline. That'll bring a third and Long. That's exactly what that is. Long immediately takes that step. He comes off the line a little bit slow, and that's why he comes off the line slow is he's waiting for the other guy to take the slant and come inside. Briley Green thought he was going to shoot right off the gun, head to the sideline. Kind of miscommunication you cannot afford, but it's the kind of stuff that's happening when, when it's not really clicking for you on offense and brings up for the, I think, for the fourth time in this game. Third and a mile for the Sagu Lions. Third and 18. Green sends Rose in motion. Back to pass is Green. Going to let it go. Takes it off. Down looking to the top for Dylan Alford. Alford could not bring it in. Good coverage on the outside by Justin Eccles. That brings up another fourth down. Go to your speed guy over the cross of the middle of the field. Nobody else is really open. Throw it down there, hope that a play can happen. That's one that maybe if the wind was at your back would have gone a little bit more favorably, but falls short yet again. So Sagu after the 25 yard pass will be forced to punt on fourth and 18. Here is Lewis. Gets it away and the wind, look at the wind take that. Oh, it goodness. was moving and just died at the 50 yard line. And that's gonna go down as a, Tim, I think that goes down as a technically a three yard punt. That's a rough one as the wind is definitely picked up and it's, you know, I don't have to be a weatherman to tell you, the wind is stratified. It's higher as it, you know, it's stronger as you go higher as we can attest to up here in our booth. A, a, a tough break there after you do get the first down, you think at least you might flip field position instead because of the wind. And that's not the kind of punt you need to be doing, maybe the kind of the sidearm punts. You're just trying to get that, that straight out. But you've already had a punt blocked today. And so that changes your, your calculations. You are trying to get it off quicker. You're just trying to get it out. And he connected with it. It, it. it looked good coming off the foot here on first down. Rogers looking for somebody incomplete behind his intended receiver. Tim, the punt came off the foot good. He, he yeah, caught it no, just it, how he needed to. That wind, it, it it's just shame. insane. And just it just killed it right at the 50. And it ended up being just a four-yard punt. Bit of a dangerous throw here. Ball got tipped over the middle. And then there were two Lions right there blanketing number 20 Devonte samuel uh, that could have gone very poorly for the rams as sagu had very good coverage at both levels second and 10 here for carson rogers in this rams offense slow snap back to pass clean pocket lets it go looking deep down the field has his man at the 50 or the 10 and he walks into the end zone he split two defenders and finds his receiver anthony bob and walks waltzes into the end zone and Texas Wesleyan looks to go up 17-0. And Jay Mosley is just going to misjudge this ball. The, the ball comes off his hands. It's a little bit underthrown. If Mosley sticks with it, he probably gets this, the pick. Instead, he can, he's going to trail forward a little bit too much. He pulls up too quick and goes over the top. 
As and the they're going to go for two, two here. Lowers the shoulder. He's into the end zone. Sagu looked all out of sorts, and that's going to put Texas Wesleyan up 18 to nothing on the two-point conversion. Yeah, for those of you who missed it right there, it was that typical look we see a lot in college now where teams line up in that very spread extra point look. And instead of, as we'll see the replay here, usually they gather back together. They saw the signal that the Lions were not ready for it. Snap it right up the middle. Give it to Kobe Adams. He's your big you defensive go. lineman. Who's going to stop him on the goal? About to say, he was one of my key players uh, for what he's <laughs> done on defense, not for taking in two-point conversions. But a big pass after the short punt. Again, a little bit of misjudging there. Had he stuck with it, he's probably going to be able to bat that ball away, maybe even have a chance at intercepting it. Instead, he pulled the brakes a little bit too soon. And after a big touchdown catch, kind of the, the worst case scenario that you feared if you're the Lions, midway through the first quarter, trailing big, 18 to nothing. Bolgett sets the kick off here. We've seen him have a couple of touchbacks so far, three to be exact, or looking for his third touchback here, rather. And it looks like he will indeed have it as it bounces through the end zone for the touchback. That is his fourth, fourth touchback of the game. He, they started the game with a touchback. That's where Sagu will take over at the 25-yard line. And I'm pretty sure he got the memo. The way Sagu won last week, got some big kick returns. Do not let any of the speedsters get in their hands. Well, we'll see what happens when they flip the field and he's got a kick into the wind. It's really hurt Sagu so yes. far to start this game. And we're not even halfway through, just over halfway through, done in the first quarter. So we'll see what happens when the field flips and what they decide to go with. But it's definitely played a factor. A bit of substitution confusion here for Sagu. And a play clock down under five. They got to get the snap off. You don't want to use a timeout. And delay a game by a couple of seconds. They, they gave him the and and the foot tap. On the offense, five-yard penalty remains first down. And again, what you saw there, we saw a little bit of substitution confusion on the sideline. And, and then at that point, you put the man in motion too late. You put a man in motion coming back into the backfield with you. That's when you've got to make that happen quicker or audible out of it. Uh, another tough start to a drive. First and 15 will turn around, hand it off. Here's Rose. Rose looking for anything, brought down for a loss again. Texas Wesleyan's defensive front doing a really good job of limiting anything going on here. Brings up second and 12. And we saw Sagu stick to the air the last few drives, trying to get something going on the ground, but nowhere to operate. No gap for Rose to, to gash through, and instead it's immediately wrapped up for a loss in the backfield. Second and 12, here's Green. Fakes the handoff. He's back to pass. Looking to the sideline. Nobody home. His intended receiver was Zach Fuller. Again, maybe just a little bit of miscommunication there as there was nobody in the vicinity. And more pressure coming. He knows it's coming. Has to get rid of it. And I, I, I think that's more of a throwaway than anything. So I think, I think this has got to be their fourth third and 15 plus of the game. Third and 17 at their own 18-yard line. Third and long, here is Green. Back to pass across the middle of the field. Odidi goes up and brings it in. Short of the line to gain. That's gonna bring up fourth and about four. Impressive to hang on to that. Uh, the way he hit the ground, I was kind of waiting for the ball to pop loose. Hangs on to it, but was facing fourth and 17, even a nice 13 yard pass. Not gonna be enough. As, yeah, does a good job of getting both hands on it, tucking it in, but Another three and out for the Sagu offense. Got a stoppage here and timeout. Time out. Texas Wesleyan, their first of the half. Timeout by Texas Wesleyan. Looks like they did not like what they saw on the punt return unit. We'll see what they can, what Sagu and the, the punting unit can do here, still facing that wind. Uh, I'll tell you what they saw. The last three punts since the block punt, or the last two punts since the block punt, Sagu has dropped three men back to guard halfway for, uh, for uh, sorry, Ryan Lewis. They had not done th that this time. They had a, another, they had one set man around three yards back. They absolutely saw what I think was a fake coming. <laughs> May, possibly. Hey, well, you got to try <laughs> to get something going here if you're Sagu. It, it, it makes sense in this scenario, especially knowing how unsuccessful the punting has been. 
But that's what they saw. Now, maybe it wasn't going to be a fake, maybe, but I think they saw that and decided to call everybody over and say, hey, just keep an eye on that. Fourth and four. And they do indeed fake it, and it's going to go nowhere. And the ball is live. It's on the ground, recovered by Texas Wesleyan. And that will set up the Rams in very good territory. Don't want to say I you know, <laughs> saw that coming, but I, I may have told everybody that was coming. Uh, <laughs> and I, I see what you're going, trying to go for there. You have a speedy guy to the right uh, and Quavion Mitchell to the left. Nobody's thinking you're actually going to go to your six foot four, 260 pound linebacker. Uh, but it, I, I think the Rams were ready to wrap up just about anybody on that one. So great field position yet again for this Rams offense after the third real special teams disaster for Sag. Rogers lets it go. He's got Caesar over the middle, dancing to the outside, ducks out of bounds after a gain of eight. Brings up second and two. Plenty of space over the middle, something we haven't, haven't seen yet, getting that separation. Very good route tree. Drag the guys down the field. Got your all star running back cutting right across. Easy pitch and catch for seven yards on first down. Second and three, they make it a gain of seven for Caesar. Rogers, three to his right, one to his left. Caesar in the backfield. He's back to pass on second down. Swings it out to Caesar. Caesar behind him. Cannot bring it in. Brings up third and three. Good pressure up the middle from Sagu. They have been bringing some blitzes that have thrown off Rogers throughout the game. Good job to get in the passing lane by Quavion Mitchell. Yep, Mitchell does a good job of, of getting around that outside there. I, I, I guess I kind of thought he had gotten closer to him uh, on the look over here, catching the replay. He really was a good distance away, but used his frame to get up there and disrupt that pass. 6'4", 260, using every inch of that six foot four to interrupt the throwing window for Rodgers. On third and three, they will hand it off. Caesar looking for anything, bounces it up. Look at the patience. Ernest Caesar turning on the Jets from 16 out into the end zone for a touchdown. We have got a flag on the field. It happened downfield. We'll see what the call is here. We'll see if it stands. Looks like the Rams are oh, walking Michael, back. Number 87 of the offense. Ten yard penalty from the spot of the foul. Remain second down. Tough penalty on Christian Myhan. That's a very tough penalty because he's gone. There is no one's going to catch him. We'll see where the holding penalty took place at. Right oh there. My right my there. That. Just a little bit of a jersey tug. And Correct. they're going to move the ball. Down. So it, they gain one yard off of its third and two. A completely unnecessary hold. You have the first down. I don't think there's any way that he's actually going to catch him. But he did tug the back of the jersey. But you're right. What great patience from Ernest Caesar to look like he was going to be dead to rights at the line of scrimmage. So he bounced back, hesitated, and then shot up for what was going to be a touchdown. They'll get another shot out of here, though, third and short. So they're set up in the same formation here. Let's see if they run the same play. Third and two. Incoming here for Texas Wesleyan. They will run the same play. Here's Caesar. Caesar following his blockers, bouncing it to the outside, Sque squeaks by one person, and then gets brought down. He does have the first down. It'll be first and goal from the nine yard line. They ran the same exact play there, Tim. Yeah, and he's not going to get the touchdown, but just as impressive. Fights through stiff arms. He's short of the line to gain right there. Has to fight off to get down to the 10 yard line. So it'll be first and goal right at the 10. So, yeah, not, not quite as impressive as a touchdown run, but may actually have been a more impressive run considering what Sagu threw at him. And that's the first first down of the game that was not a touchdown for <laughs> Texas Wesleyan. And they're up 18-0. <laughs> first and goal to hand it off to Caesar again. Caesar waiting for his blocks to form. He falls forward for about three yards, make it first and or second and goal from the six. This is that red zone where they have struggled throughout the year. Again, their touchdown came on a 46-yard pass. So, and you already kind of saw them maybe struggle a little bit right there. Had to really fight for it to, to pick up the first down there. Saggy with their backs against the walls. Uh, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're in desperate times already trying to keep this from being a bigger score than it already Bobble is. Bobble to snap. Rodgers lets it go to the end zone. It's intercepted in the end zone. Sagu gets their first big play on defense. Isaac Gowdy 
beating his man to the spot, brings it in, Sagu's ball at the 20-yard line. Huge turnover for this Lions defense. Rodgers has been a little bit careless in this game already, and that's one that he wants back as soon as it comes out of his hands. You almost see it wobble. It's almost like he tried to pull it back as it left. So right as we mentioned, the red zone struggles of the Rams, their first red zone incursion of the game, Sagu's defense comes up huge with a pick in the end zone. Gives the ball back to their offense and at least for the moment keeps this one from getting totally out of hand. First and 10 from the 20 yard line thanks to the interception by Isaac Gowdy. Back to pass, looking deep down the sideline for Long. Long goes up, cannot bring it in. Probably would have been out of bounds anyway. Not a bad ball there from Green though, looking for Jamal Long down the sideline. That's gonna be the problem when you're really your only path is going to the sidelines with your tall receivers. You've got to rely on a lot of factors the coverage was there. Ball was pretty well placed where Long did have a chance, but even if he had brought it in, he was going to be you know, a solid yard and a half, two yards out of bounds. Second and 10 here for Sagu. Four wide, two either side for Green. Back to pass. Let's go to the sideline just out of reach of Paul Odidi. Odidi was open. We could have had some yardage there. Odidi was open, and he, the turn happened a tad bit too late. And Briley Green had maybe another second to think about it or had Odidi swiveled a bit faster. That's probably going to be a very good connection. Instead, the ball comes out right here, and Odidi need to make that cut probably more at the 26-yard line instead of the 28. Third and 10, another third and long situation here for Sagu. Back to pass. Green facing immediate pressure. Has to roll out and just get rid of it. That's going to be a fourth and 10. Green was under immediate fire there from this Texas Wesleyan defense. Yeah, nowhere to go with it. Good coverage and Green, yep, running for his life is coming right from his blind side. Number 52 for the Rams. Arian Bott with the pressure. So another three and out after the big interception in the end zone. Here's Lewis. Lewis gets it away. It's a low line drive kick, and it heads straight for the Sagu sideline. And that's going to set up Texas Wesleyan in phenomenal field position yet again as that went from the 20 to the 35, a 15-yard punt. You really got to feel for Ryan Lewis right now, dealing with the absolute worst wind conditions we've seen so far this year. He has a first quarter where his team's had to punt six times. That's, that's a lot of punts uh, for a game often. Uh, six first quarter punts. And pretty much all of them have been disastrous in one way or the other. I guess technically two of them never happened. One was blocked and one was a fake. Taking a shot deep downfield, looking for his man, incomplete. Little too far out of range for Anthony Bob, who has the sole offensive touchdown today for the Rams at 46 yard receiving touchdown just a couple of drives ago. Had plenty of time to throw in the pocket, but so far the Sagu defenders, the Sagu secondary has stood up very well. Even that one touchdown really came off of being a little greedy, a misplayed ball on that deep pass. Second and 10 here for Rodgers. Rodgers back to pass. Thought maybe he would have drawn him off sides. He's taking a shot deep down the field. Back shoulder ball brought in at the 10. Spins off a tackle and then brought down at right at the 10 yard line. Nice little pitch and catch to his man out there wide. TJ Curtis with a first down reception. And a little bit of a delayed reaction there for Lontarius McLean. He overshot the route. Had, it, another time the ball was pretty much underthrown. If he had double back in time, it's going to easily make a play on that. Goes a little bit too far downfield and makes it easy on him as they're right back first and goal to 10 yard line. Chains are down, so it is a true goal to go situation. Here's Ernest Caesar trying to make something happen. Picks up one, makes it second and goal from the nine. Not a lot of success on the ground so far for a guy who's going over 100 yards a game. He hasn't had many opportunities. They've nope. had short fields all day today. It's really, you know, it's tough to get 100 yards a game when you're starting on the 25-yard <laughs> line every drive. True. Second and goal from the nine here for the Rams offense. Two and a half left to play in the first quarter. 
Tight formation, two, one receiver on either side here for Texas Wesleyan. They will hand it off on the draw to Caesar. Caesar trying to bounce it to the outside. He's got the speed, turns on the Jets, tries to cut it back up inside, gets brought down, and a flag comes in at the very end of the play. We might see a face mask here, Tim. From this vantage point, it looked like that might have been what happened. You already see uh, Dylan Coffin pleading his case. Personal foul, face mask, yeah. number 21 at the defense. Half the distance to the goal from the end of the run. Automatic uh, first down. Which that angle that actually looked like a shoulder pad. And I'm going to say the side judge standing at the goal line who had the best vantage point did not throw the flag. It was the ref way down the field who did not have the best vantage point through the flag. And, uh, that's, that's definitely a missed call. That's, that's that, bad. It might have happened Yikes. right there where we can't see it, but the ref standing on top they of the They will hand it off flag. on first and goal from the one, and Ernest Caesar finishes the drive with a one-yard touchdown run. And Texas Wesley looking to go up 25 to nothing. As you said, didn't have to go very far. Another drive to start at the 35-yard line. And, and again, an impressive one-yard run, all things considered. Carlos Charleston almost had him wrapped up in the backfield. Up and in is the extra point, makes it 25 to nothing here in the first quarter. Texas Wesleyan trying to do their best uh, Georgia Tech impression. <laughs> <laughs> On pace for 100 points here in this game so far. Got score updates that game. We were talking about a moment ago. Marion does hold on to win on the road. That big top 11 matchup against Concordia. Meanwhile, Baker starting to pull away from Mid-America Nazarene. Look down there. Morningside up 20 to 3 on Dakota Wesleyan. Friends ahead of Southwestern 12 to nothing. And then Rocky Mountain versus Montana Western still early in that one. But it's 6 to nothing. Meanwhile, 2.03 left here and... In the first quarter. In the first <laughs> quarter. Th th this might be when you hit the power button on the Xbox uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, nothing has gone right. I dare say your only goal on this drive is to run out the clock on the first quarter and get the wind at your back. On to kick for Texas Wesleyan. And it's going to be a high little pooch kick. They're going to give them a chance here. Here's Alford. Alford fumbles it, bobbles it. He picks it up at the one-yard line. Alford trying to make something happen here, trying to keep his feet. He keeps on going, trying to push the pile. Ultimately gets brought down at the 11-yard line. And Sagu again with bad field position here to start this drive. The wind still in their face. And this is going to be tough for Sagu. Looks like they almost caught him off guard with how much they've been just booming it out the back of the end zone. They weren't completely ready. Alford, you know he wants a chance to return it. Goes through his hands and just has to fight and scrap for everything just to keep it, you know, out of out of the inside the 10 danger zone. First and 10 here for Briley Green. Will take the snap. He is back to pass. Looking to the sideline. Falls incomplete. Looking for Odidi. Could not connect. <laughs> Another one where it's just not clear who's supposed to be getting it. Uh, it's, you know, miscommunication across the board. Throw into a spot on the field where not even an, an attempt can be made. Not, not even a diving chance. Second and ten sends Fuller into the backfield. We'll turn around, hand it off to Rose. Rose trying to push the pile, but he has met immediately no gain there on second down. Brings up third and ten. Another third and long situation here for Sagu in this offense. Yeah. Not, have not had any opportunities to dial up set plays really on third down. It's all been to try to get guys downfield because of that lack of traction on the first two downs. Taking their time getting that play in. They're going to go four wide with a pistol formation. So we haven't seen this exact lineup yet. They move Jamal Long back to the inside. Third and ten here for Briley Green. Back to pass on third down. Wanted to go deep. He's met in the backfield. Another sack for Texas Wesleyan. Nowhere to go with the ball for Briley Green. And that'll bring up fourth and ten. And look at Texas Wesleyan time taking a timeout to half. stop 
to stop the clock and force Sagu to kick into the wind again. That is a heads-up play for Texas Wesleyan and head coach uh, on that sideline. I'm not even sure if you had to. There were still 53 seconds left, so I guess theoretically Sagu could have taken a, an intentional delay of game uh, and restarted the clock at that point. Uh, I'm not sure they had to do that, but regardless... Co uh, Coach Joe Prudhomme wants another shot at offense with the wind at his back here. Yeah. And can you blame him? It, it, oh, you no, put up 25 it, points in the fourth quarter, your first quarter. You can't you can't ask for anything else. Yeah. And you look at Ryan Lewis's heels, they're going to be on the back of his own end zone again. The, the story has completely been special teams of, of how this disaster has unfolded for the Lions. Obviously, a total lack of offense and every single punt has been a gift for the Rams. From the four yard line, here's Lewis. There's a flag that comes out, low line drive punt. Bounces and then bounces away from the return man. Settles at the 36 yard line. We may have an offsides on the Rams. Getting a little too eager to try to get that second block punt. So yeah, they're gonna ask the Lions what they wanna do, whether they wanna re-kick it or just tack it on. I would tack it on. Yeah. As it stands right now, it's a 32-yard punt. You tack it on, it makes it a 37-yard punt effectively. Waiting for the official call here. I'm not sure. I, I think Sagu's, I think he's probably double checking to see if it's one you can tack on. I'm honestly never 100% clear when you can tack it on and when you can't. <laughs> uh, it seems to change uh, moment to moment. So Bobby's just debating how to enforce the penalty. And I think you're right. You don't want to repunt right now if you, if you escape disaster with everything. We have an illegal formation on the defense. Number 81 was lined up over the center. That penalty will be declined. First down, Texas Westland. Oh, so it's not one you can enforce. That's where the debate was. Again, it all depends on what kind of penalty it is and the scenario as to whether or not you can actually enforce it after the kick. But Zagu will simply opt to accept where they, where they are at the moment so from the 36-yard line, Texas Wesleyan, it seems like they have lived in Sagu territory today. It's, it seems rare that they had the ball inside their own 50-yard, inside their own territory on their own 50. But now, from the 36... I, I think only the first drive of the game, they set up on their end of the field, and that was their first three and out. Other than that, they have been on Sagu's end of the field every snap of this game. Back to pass, here's Rodgers. Facing pressure, he's hit as he throws. Ball is in the air, falls to the turf harmlessly. That is a scary play for Texas Wesleyan. Ooh, and Rogers, and Rogers is, is slow up. to get up. He got hit hard on that release. Yeah, he got absolutely blasted. And Sagu just unable to. Yeah, that's a, just a hard hit on his shoulder. Quavion Mitchell hits Carson Rogers. He's holding it, and that's the only thing that could go wrong if you're the Rams right now in a game that you've taken absolute control of in the very first frame. Uh, you don't want to see anything like that with your starting quarterback. So in the ball game now, Colin Johnson, the freshman quarterback for Texas Wesleyan, will take at least one snap here. And we'll see when, if Rodgers can come back into the game. It'll be second and ten. Johnson takes a snap, he hands it off. Looking for something to happen here. Lowers the shoulder, nothing doing there. Nice little, it's a little two yard run there for Ashton Mitchell. Sagu strings it out, brings up third and eight. They've done a good job in the trenches. All the yards that the Rams have picked up on the ground have come off of broken tackles, stiff arms, getting around to the corner. They've done a good job up front, stringing them out, not letting that run well, see, all they, over They've them. got a decision to make here because they can run out the clock here to get to the second quarter, but then the field flips. So they've got 11 seconds. They will hand it off, cuts to the outside, lowers the shoulder, and he's got enough. He's close to that first They're down. They're gonna mark him just shy, I it's think. Gonna be fourth and one, and Texas Wesleyan takes a timeout, their third timeout of the first half, their last one. Texas Wesleyan, their third final timeout of the half. So they're, they're, they're doing he says that. of the half, but it's, it's the first quarter. They've taken all three timeouts, and they are playing this field position masterfully. Absolutely they are. They, they just got it off, and I wonder if that means they're going to opt for the field goal in the situation. It's well, I think, fourth I, and one. That's the only reason I think yeah, you do it. You wouldn't need to 
if you burn the timeout just to run a quarterback sneak or something here, uh, that wouldn't make a ton of sense. But I don't see the kicking unit yet. It's always hard to tell in the scrum who's who's lined up there. Where, as a stand, Actually, I, I see I see Danny Trejo out there. So yeah, I think they are going to line up. Trejo would be the holder. Yep. So. It'll be a 44-yard field goal attempt here from the 27-yard line. Because that'd be the only reason you'd actually find it necessary to so they, they've used two timeouts in the final minute of the first quarter all just to preserve this massive wind advantage they, no no one's going to say that's why they, they're winning in this game right now but it has certainly helped here in the first quarter and they do trot out for the field goal attempt from the 27 like i said 44 yard attempt here for garrett blodgett and danny trejo to hold here Good snap, good hold. The kick is up, and it is good by plenty. <laughs> Looking at the trajectory of that kick, that would have been good from 60. That, he that was, killed that, that thing. was clear. So that is the final play of the first quarter, a first quarter that goes for 46 minutes and only feels like six and a half hours if you're the Lions. 28 <laughs> nothing, the score between Texas Wesleyan and Sagu. And that is about as good of a start as you can have if you're Texas Wesleyan. You gotta love being it up this much after 15 minutes of play. 50, uh, up this much without having to do anything if at all on offense. Your offensive touchdown drives have come off of one big pass play from the 46 yard line and an abbreviated 35 yard drive all thanks to special teams. Meanwhile, your special teams gets a touchdown. Uh, you get a field goal where you don't pick up a first down. And you get another field goal right there where you don't actually pick up a first down on the drive. You know what? Field is flipped. It's time for Sagu to put up 28 points. That's all we're looking at here. <laughs> the, the wind will be at their back for the first time. See some more sc score updates. Evangel leading Bethany 14-3 to as Georgetown up big over Cumberland. 42-14 to late in that one. Texas Wesleyan to kick off. Now into the wind, and you see it take effect there. The ball just dies and lands. Now it's dangerous, and he's hit. Colby Tanner is lucky to get possession of that ball as it bounced at the 22, and he pulled it in and was immediately hit. Look at this. Look at this thing just die in yeah. the air. It just, it just stops. It just stops. It, we, we have known that Waxahachie is kind of a wind corridor for a long time. We have seen games impacted. I don't feel like this is the most intense one I've ever seen, but it's definitely the most I've ever seen it factor in this many times, where it's been clear how many passes have been batted down from it and how many punts have, and kicks have simply died because of it. Here is Green on first and 10. Back to pass. Looking across the middle field. He's got Odidi. Odidi hit hard after the reception, but he pulls it in. That's going to break up second and four. Second time in this game that Odidi's had to hang on to a pass while getting hammered and going to the ground. He's doing really well on these slant routes, though. It, it's, he's really only been a kind of a outside receiver before. They've been moving him more inside, and he's starting to kind of come alive with it. Second and four, back to pass. Green looking across the middle of the field. He's got long, a long off his hands. It was kind of behind him and a little bit low. Had to go down to try to get it, and it falls incomplete. Brings up third down. And you see the guy crashing over the top. Had he not been there, maybe Green would have let him a little bit more instead, long having to slam the brakes on, slips. Not sure if you put that down as a clean drop pass or not, but he did hit him in the hands, unable to pick it up, and the Sagu Lions will face another third down. Third and four, back to pass. Green looking deep for his man. Long, long overshoots his intended receiver. Does Briley Green, and that'll bring up another three and out. And this is where Ryan Lewis hopes to increase that yards per punt with the wind at his back now. Another one they had to get off very quickly, but there was never even a chance at it. Double covered. They know that Odidi and Long are kind of the only two options. They are doing an excellent job of blanketing them, and that pass wasn't even close. Lewis has it. Gets it away, and this is 
more of what we're used to seeing here from Ryan Lewis. Bounces at the 22, goes out of bounds at the 20-yard line. Does indeed flip the field, does Ryan Lewis. Actually get down at the 22-yard line, but still, much better job with the wind that is back. Yeah, no, that, that, you, you, you hate to see a quarter like that for a guy who you know is really excellent at his position. And, and, and the havoc it's going to wreak on his, uh, his annual stats right there. But it is what it is. Unable able to uncork one here. And so Sagu's defense for the first time in this game have some green behind them to defend and not just, you know, a tiny scrap. First time since Texas Wesleyan's first offensive drive of the game are they starting in their own territory. From their own 22, first and 10, they will hand it off on first down. Caesar looking for to make something happen here, but picks up two. And we see Carson Rogers yeah. back into the game, so it's good to good to see. Maybe just got his bell rung on that one play, but he looks like he's good to go. Yeah, you're always worried when you see a hit around the shoulder as to whether or not it's going to actually be a structural injury. Time out for an injured offensive player. And it player looks like Ernest Caesar. Caesar is slow to get up. Kind of two yards and a cloud of dust there. You never know what happens at the bottom of a pile. And when you're, uh, when you're standing at 5'6", that pile can sometimes be a little ominous. We'll hope to see he's okay. He's walking off on his own powers. That's always a good sign. Yeah, this looks like he's walking a little gingerly, so maybe one of those got hurt plays versus got injured. Just need to take a breather. Checking in is Ashton Mitchell at running back. Second and eight here for Texas Wesleyan. 28-0 lead for the Rams here as we are into the second quarter. One either side here for Rodgers. He will turn around and hand it off. Mitchell, Mitchell looking to make something happen. Sagu doing a good job bringing him down for a loss of four. Brings up third and 12. Defense standing strong still. Holding their own in this one. As they bring up a third and long. And really no success on the ground. A team that we know is very good at running. But they have not found that success yet. Now they haven't, as you, as you said, it's hard to pile up yardage uh, when you're starting so close. But even so, Sagi was an excellent job of eliminating that ground attack. They will just hand it off here on third and long, trying to make a little bit better field position here for their punter. But they will get brought down. Keith Hargraves on the stop. Makes it third and 10. So a three and out incoming here for Texas Wesleyan. And we'll see how they fare with the wind at their face now with this punting unit in Daniel Trejo. It's very interesting. You can kind of see the, the strategy already on the Rams side. Facing a third and long, you've got a good offense. You know you have a 28-0 lead. They don't even try to punt, to throw the ball downfield, understanding how big of a deal this wind is. And there you see a good job by Trejo. Does get the ball into Sagu territory. About as good a job as you can do there as a punter with the wind in your face as strong as it's been. Just get the ball into the other team's territory. Just do what you can. And Trejo, he's a guy, he, he did excellent up at the top collegiate level playing for the Texas Longhorns. And uh, so I know he was really looking to break into that next big level. The opportunities weren't there this offseason. So got the year of eligibility, come back here. And obviously, worst case scenario for him, like, oh, no, there's wind. I can't have my stats hurt today. Green completes it on the outside to his receiver, Tyson Nanette. And that was a great adjustment by Nanette. The ball was thrown behind him. Has to completely adjust, dive backwards. Makes the catch, crosses in. And this is the first time that Sagu has crossed the 50-yard line. They got to the 50-yard line on one drive. But the first time they've actually gotten into Rams field position. Back to pass again. This time he finds Zach Fuller. Fuller picks up a first down. That is the second first down of the ball game here for Sagu as they move the chains. And this is the most successful drive they've had here so far today inside Texas Wesleyan territory. And probably the first time we've seen a route tree work. You go two levels there, you get a guy, drag a guy deep. That allows Fuller to cut outside, make a nice catch, scamper for the first down. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not great when you're pointing out the, the times things work. Uh, but, but you finally do see a pattern work there for the Lions. First and 10, back to pass is green. Good pickup by Rose, looking for Fuller. Flag comes out, might have gotten hooked on that out route. So we'll see if this is an automatic first down. It looks like it probably will be against Texas Wesleyan here. Yeah, right here, he's gonna yeah, pull that oh, arm back. 
get the defense, 10-yard penalty from the previous spot, automatic first down. So they're not going to rule it pass interference, interestingly, even though the ball was in the air. That's actually better uh, for the Lions because had it been pass interference, it would have simply been a spot foul. Instead, they ruled it defensive holding, which gives them 10 yards. Have not seen penalties in this game, really, on either That's side. Sagu's picked game. up a couple yep. procedural, yep. Uh, a delay of game and one uh, unsportsmanlike conduct, probably just some jawing. Back to pass, Green looking to the flat again. He's got Nanette, another good grab by Tyson Nanette. Sticks the hands out, it just sticks in there. Good catch. And Sagu has changed up their offense here. They're not going sideline anymore, they're not going fade, they're going quick hitches. Run down the field, turn around. You also saw the exact same pattern there for Zach Fuller. Rush down the field, take, plant your foot, turn around and see if the ball's coming. Uh, you know, they, they've kind of dialed things up here now. Second and five, back to pass green. Slips, loses his footing. I'm not sure he was contacted, no. but regardless, loses his feet and goes down, and that brings up another third and long. Trying to recover quickly, getting that pressure from the outside, ducks underneath. Yeah, doesn't ever get touched, just loses his footing. Ball to 33, third and 12. Would definitely be the very periphery of Sagu's field goal range. Got to pick up some yardage here if you want to try to attempt to get points here. Third and 12, Green back to pass. Steps up, lets it go, looking down the sideline. Cannot bring it in, Zach Fuller, the intended receiver. It was there, it's a lot on that from Briley Green. Yeah, he's, he is zipping it in there right now, and I think it caught Fuller off guard. You'll see his hands right here shoot up suddenly. That's that's a surprised uh, reach. That, that's not seeing the ball coming. And they will go for it here on fourth and 12. Like you said, it was on the cusp of their field goal kicker's range. And at this point, down 28-0. Yeah, you, you, you need points of any kind, and you need touchdowns more than anything. And oh, Odidi, Odidi brings it in. He's going to be shy. short of the line to gain. A good catch by Paul Odidi, but it's going to result in a turnover on downs, and Texas Wesleyan takes over. So they finally get some stuff going on offense. They change things up, make it very quick, and Bradley Green starts zipping it in there for some... Nice, quick catches. Unfortunately, you have the one big negative play that throws things off its rhythm, and you can't convert on the fourth and long. So the Rams take over at their own 24-yard line. We see Ashton Mitchell remain in the game here for Texas Wesleyan. Ernest Caesar went down a little bit ago. Look to see if we can catch a glimpse of him. They will hand it off to Mitchell. Mitchell following his blockers. He had open field, but a good job by Sagu on that outside. Xavier Garcia may have just saved the touchdown. Yeah, that got scary in a hurry. He has his big man blocking up there, ducks underneath, and right there, he still had a couple of guys up top, but if he had gotten through, he's at least crossing midfield before somebody's really going to be able to take him down. Ball up at the 34-yard line, so it was just enough for the first down. First and 10, new set of downs here for Texas Wesleyan. They will hand it off to Mitchell again. Mitchell trying to make something happen. Met quickly is able to spin forward for about a yard. Brings up second and nine. Quavion Mitchell is having himself a very good game. He's been in a lot of these tackles. Has had some passes defended essentially at the line of scrimmage. He unfortunately also has one carry for negative four yards, but uh, that, he, he didn't sign up for that in pregame. <laughs> second and nine here for Texas Wesleyan. A little bit of a, a line change here for, for the Rams on offense. Two to the right, one to the left here for Carson Rogers. I haven't had to see him do much today through the air. He's back to pass here on second down. Let's it go, looking deep down the sideline. Has his man, goes up and brings it in. He fumbles it on his way out of bounds. Will they call this a completed catch and a fumble? It looks like they will yep. indeed, and that'll move the chains. A.J. Bob goes up and gets it. And how about that? Out of Bob, he is not the biggest receiver in the world. He comes in standing 5'10", goes up and brings it in over the Sagu defensive back. He is the obvious go-to guy on this Rams team has the touchdown earlier 
And this this is going to be a catcher. He's going to oh, go yeah. up. Yeah. He's tucks got it. it. Two, One, three. two, three. Yeah, yeah. easily. If, and then the right at the fours when the ball gets popped loose. Hagu's just wishing it would have had a little bit friendlier of a roll. They will hand it off here on first down, and it'll go for no gain as Ashton Mitchell. Nothing doing there. Brings up second and ten. That's pretty easily ruled a catch. Mm -hmm. Like I said, four steps. Yeah. He had it. Just kind of lost it right at the very end. Catch and fumble. And you can even see on Sagu's sideline, it's funny, they all go from quickly pointing at the ball, recover, recover it, goes out of bounds to incomplete, incomplete, incomplete. <laughs> so you make yeah, up your mind. Qu qu quickly adapt your opinion based upon what helps you the best, obviously. Uh. <laughs> Second and 10 here for Texas Wesleyan. 7.45 left to play in the first half. This uh, second quarter has moved along significantly faster than the first quarter did, Tim. Back to pass. Here's <laughs> Rogers looking across the middle. He's got Bob. Bob brings it in, survives a big hit, and he's got enough for the first down. That is a tough catch by Bob. New set of downs here for Texas Wesleyan. Does a good job. It's a, that quick slant route coming off the line of scrimmage. If you're a good enough receiver, that feels borderline undefendable if you've got the speed and quickness out of the gate. It's just about whether or not the, the linebacker is able to quickly respond enough and if you can survive the hit because he took a hard hit right there. First and 10 will hand it off to Mitchell. Mitchell looking for a crease, finds one, ducks through it, and he's got a good gain there on first down. A gain of six, make it second and four. Mitchell still coming in and taking over for Ernest Caesar and he's definitely using his, his smaller frame to, to duck in underneath some of these tacklers. You know, it's it's funny. They both both the running backs here for Texas Wesleyan so far, like you said, smaller frames, but Caesar seems to be more explosive whereas Mitchell is more of your t prototypical power back. He invites yeah. the contact. It's very interesting. They'll hand it off here to Mitchell again. Mitchell Finding the hole, falling forward, keeping the feet moving, moves the chains here for Texas Wesleyan. This is what we've seen so far this season, Tim, and why they average about seven a, seven a carry, 200 yards a game. They just grind and grind and grind and pick up first downs. And, and you've seen this, you know, this equation all over football at every level of, of that's what you want. You want a, a speed guy and you want a, a ground and pound guy. And if you've got both, it makes it very hard to defend for a full 60-minute game. And it all depends on who's better, who's uh, running back A, who's running back B. They'll take a shot to the end zone here, and Sagu's offside, goes up, brings it in, a one-handed catch. Are you kidding me? Double covered, goes up, TJ Curtis. What a grab down on the sideline. Take a look at this, oh my goodness. And it will be a free play. And Sagu has two men in the area. Tips it to himself, brings it in. Wow, what a catch by TJ Curtis. Yep, the first tip was essentially just to keep the ball from going out of bounds. That penalty won't be declined, results of the play. It's the first down. So down inside the three yard line, right at the, just outside the two, so first and goal. The Rams, for the first time in this game, have really started to march. Uh, they haven't had opportunities to march, obviously. They will hand it off here on first and goal. Lo lowering his shoulder to the end zone. Touchdown, Rams. Ashton Mitchell from two yards out. Shows off the power, dives into the end zone. And Texas Wesleyan very close to going up 35 to zero here in the second quarter. And it all comes off of a long, methodical drive. The first time they've had to do that in this game. As they will line up yet again for kind of the two-point conversion Looking look. Looking to go for two, and they will hand it off to the up man, and he will not get in. So it'll be 34-0 here for Texas Wesleyan. And they went to your, your player to watch again earlier, as they did and succeeded, Kobe Adams. Haven't called his name on defense yet, but called it twice on uh, essentially offensive plays. As the Rams, as you mentioned, go around 74 yards after Sagu turns it over on downs. Did it with a couple of nice passes. And that was our first really sustained drive. Yeah. We haven't had to see them drive the length of the field necessary, but that's their longest drive of the afternoon so far. And they 
Uh, Tim, they did it with ease. Yeah, I don't know if they. I don't know if they faced a single third down. No, I don't believe they did. No, and, and after and that, that's the best recipe for avoiding third downs. Stay when, ahead when, of the chains. When yep. you have seen them already struggle in this game with third downs, they had two, three and outs uh, when they started on their their side of the field before. There are other touchdown drives, but, and they've struggled with third downs when they've had to settle for two field goals after, you know, getting the ball so deep that they didn't need a first down to pick it up. So they have really not moved the chains regularly. Their defense and special teams have just been so completely dominant that if you're having the tiniest bit of an off day, uh, no one is noticing right now. And we'll kick it short again. This is fielded at the 30. Makes a man miss. Now, look out. Second trying to make something happen. Fighting up forward. We don't really get to call the name of Justin Campbell on kickoff return very often, but he, he made a man miss, and it got exciting for a second. But Seku will ultimately take over on the 33-yard line. Does that first little move Sideline warning to get around? Texas Wesleyan coaching staff. That's their first and only warning. So got a sideline warning. Get a little bit too close to the field. Got to get you get back, coach. <laughs> sideline for Texas Wesleyan. Five twenty-three left to play in the first half. Sagu will take over from their thirty-three yard line, down thirty-four to nothing. Green, bunch formation here to his right will pitch it to his outside. Nothing doing there. A hole or a flag comes in at the end. And this will probably go against Sagu. As they got it to uh, Draylon Taylor. Of the offense. The penalty will be declined. Second down. They decline the penalty. It'll make it second and call it 15 here for second and 16 rather for Sagu just nothing doing here for Sagu on offense now nope, we kind of got some, su some success on that last drive with the quick hitters but definitely not in the running game to the edges and yeah when, when you have that blatant holding penalty and there's only seven other guys in the vicinity uh, you know it's not working for you on the ground they complete it to long long survives the hit falls forward and picks up some of that lost yardage it'll make it third and seven this is pretty much what they've got to do. Obviously, not even a step back, just a snap, set, throw. And count on these big receivers on the quick slants and the quick outs. They call it third and six here, rather. Zagu on third down. Here's Green looking to the flat. He's got Odidi. Odidi trying to cut up field. He's going to be short of that first down market again, about two yards short to be exact. It brings a fourth and two. We'll see what they do here on fourth and short. Still some debate right now, but it looks like they're going to go ahead and stay under five minutes left. I thought Odidi got closer to the 42 there, but he gets marked down to 41. Fourth and two incoming. Here's Sagu on fourth down. Green back to pass. We're in the middle field looking for Colby Tanner. Too high, incomplete. Another turnover on downs. Back-to-back -back turnover on downs here for Sagu. That just a bit too high. If he levels that out for Colby Tanner, he's going to hit him right in the chest. He's going to have a very solid shot of pulling that in and picking up the first down. Maybe more. There really wasn't another guy across the middle of the field, but Texas Wesleyan has pass. Texas Wesleyan has the uh, one of your favorite things to do here, Tim. The double dip. It kicked off to start the game. So if they score here on offense, they've got an opportunity coming out of halftime with the ball to go down and potentially get another score. So we'll see what they do here with uh, four and some change left on the clock here in the first half. First down, back to pass. They swing it out quickly. Brings it in, but it's hit. And it might have been better if he had just dropped it. That'll be a loss of a lot. They're on first down. I think a loss of seven. I'll say I'm not even sure if that was going to be a pass or a lateral at that point. It's it, pretty it been, close. It was it was pretty so, even. So he, he that's I think that's why he was. Oh, that's forward. That's forward. So that was forward. But I think some of this effort to to bring it in still towards the end was because he wasn't sure if it was a lateral or not. We well, always you always want to catch it. You yeah. never know. You always want to catch it. You, you don't think in that situation. Well, if I just let this hit the turf, it's it's actually a net positive right. for the outcome of the game or for the down. We'll see. Second and seventeen here for Texas. Wesley, they will just hand it off. Looking to make something happen here. Kind of follows his blockers there for a short gain of three, maybe four. That'll bring up 
third and 13. Good job of getting fighting for that extra yard or two after getting hit up front. Still haven't seen starting running back Ernest Caesar come back into the game. Now, some of that may just be mathematics. If you got a guy who's hurt a little bit, ailing, and would be able to go any other time, but you don't see a reason to right now, go ahead and let, uh, you know, 1B, R2, whatever you want to call them, get, get some carries today. Taking a shot deep here. It's under thrown. Some contact and a flag will come out and be an automatic first down here for Texas Wesleyan. And that is just a almost an impossible play to defend if you were at Lontarius McLean on the outside. And very unnecessary contact. The ball is going to land three yards short of where the receiver is. And I'll say, as, as in general, Pass interference, I am number five of the defense. 15-yard penalty from the previous spot. Automatic first down. I am not a fan of kind of the way that this rule is enforced across all of football, that you can underthrow a receiver by three, four yards, well, Tim, that's and he a, that's turns an, around that's and an gets run over. Ball. You right. talk about uncatchable balls being over the head of the receiver. Yeah. That ball is an uncatchable ball. Uh, and, and I think, I mean, I see you see it every week in college football in the NFL. You know, somebody underthrowing his receiver by four yards, he comes back and runs into the defender and his pass interference. Yeah, my, my thought is the same thing. If the ball sails four yards over his head and he gets tripped, we don't call it. So it's just the way it gets called right now. I would love to see it change because it, it has a lot of game-changing implications in a lot of situations where it go, it's very unearned. <laughs> like that right there was not going to be caught. There was actually no true interference uh, in, in the truest sense of interfering with the chance to make a catch. As it stands, it, it gives Texas Wesleyan that automatic first down, and they can kind of kill the clock here as we approach under two minutes to play in the first half. Second and nine incoming here for the Rams. They will hand it off again to Mitchell. Mitchell cuts up field. He's got a lot of grass in front of him, carries a man, and he's spun down at the 10-yard line. A couple of flags, three, three flags. flags. Everybody's throwing a flag on that one. They all saw something. This could be coming back here for Texas Wesleyan. Actually, now, Mitchell, it's gonna Mitchell be a, was, it looks like it's a face mask against Sagu Yeah, Mitchell here. was grabbing his own face yep. mask. Personal foul, face mask, number five of the defense. Half the distance to the goal from the end of the run. Automatic first down. Well, Ontarius McLean gets nabbed for the face mask. And that is just a, another frustrating play for Sagu's defense. Yeah, about to bring up a third down, and instead it hands him the ball. First and goal at the five. Clock continues to move here for Texas Wesleyan. They will hand it off here on first down. Mitchell lowers his shoulder, carries a man into the end zone. The Rams put up another touchdown, and they are looking to put 40-plus up here in the first half. 40 to nothing, pending an extra point to go up potentially 41-zip here in Waxahachie. Another grinding run. Faced opposition the whole way, but Mitchell... Keeps the legs churning and drags. And that's not an easy kind of drag right there. Taking Noah Gibson into the end zone. That, that does not happen uh, without a lot of effort. Extra point is up and good. 41-0 the lead for Texas Wesleyan. We got a live look in here to the Rocky Mountain Montana Western game where it looks like Montana Western just tacked on a touchdown to go up 16 to 6, pending the extra point. Look at those rolling hills there in the background of Montana. <laughs> Very nice backdrop. I've got no problem with our backdrop here in Waxahachie, but it could use some rolling hills. <laughs> I think Texas in general could use some hills too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking out. I can see 100 oh, miles oh, either we, direction. Oh, and there's mountains in the other direction. Oh, I, that is I, beautiful, I hyped, man. I have the other end zone too quickly. The other side is where is where the beauty is. So that yeah, it is beautiful, man. I'm looking. I'm looking either direction here from the booth, and I can see nothing but flat. <laughs> I mean, on the upside, you can see the Dallas skyline from here. That is the upside to Texas. If you look out that direction, oh, you can actually see the that. Dallas skyline. I didn't notice that. Look at that. You look south, you can see the Houston skyline. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's just uh, that flat. 
41 nothing Texas Wesleyan with the lead as they kick off here into the wind we've seen them utilize short kicks and they will do it again Colby Tanner has to dive to bring this one in and Sagu will take over at the 24 yard line so Texas Wesleyan doing a really good job of using this wind mm -hmm. and it has absolutely been a factor today using it to their advantage on both sides of the field yeah pop the, those little pop-up kicks right there hey, there see I proved it there's the Dallas skyline right there you can see it off in the Look distance hazy they've got their mountains we've got the skyline that is 30 miles away that we can see yeah <laughs> <laughs> with three different water towers in the frame as well. Uh, Fair catch made behind the 25-yard line. Ball is placed at the 25-yard line. First down. Oh, heads up. Heads up. Play there to call for the fair catch and get the Apparently that's not a common thing in all states seeing water towers. I've heard people from out of state before talking about how weird to see Texas water towers. So I don't know which state that is that would be that way. It did take me by surprise. I, I'm from Pennsylvania. We don't have water towers. Like well, see, that. okay, yeah. so I, I knew that was a, 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 a strange thing. It is definitely for, odd. For I was not, not used to it when I first got here, but now it's. <laughs> I, I drive five minutes either direction, I'm going to see double-digit water towers. At it's this the point. only way to know what city you're in. You look up <laughs> and, and you see what years they won the state championship hey, on the absolutely, water tower. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Two-yard loss on first down brings up second and 12 as we are under just about under a minute to play here in the first half but no to what you were saying it really is it shows heads up football on special teams when the wind's at your back kick it 16 yards at the back of the end zone when it's in your face pop it up make it a potential onside kick they, they, they think through everything like that green looking for odidi on the sideline as he rolled out to his right incomplete brings up third and 12 44 seconds left to play in this first half and not much good happens when Sagu starts rolling. Pretty much the only success that they have found on offense has been those quick hitters. If the play's taking too much time to develop, it just has not been successful for them. Third and 12 incoming here for Sagu. He will turn around and hand it off. Cutting to the outside, spinning and getting back to the original line of scrimmage. That was Dr Draylon Taylor. That's going to be fourth and ten, and that should be the last play that is run here in the first half. Yep, that'll be it. The Rams have no more timeouts to use, so they will not be able to get the ball back here. As that will, as Sagu is lining up on offense still. The Rams are very confused. They had left the field. Uh oh. Uh oh. They, they, they brought their punt unit out. Back to pass, here is Green. Green, looking for anything, lets it go to the sideline, off the hands of his intended receiver and falls incomplete. So Sagu trying to catch the Rams completely off guard, they did, but it's going to completely backfire as they are unable to complete the pass and there are still four seconds left on the clock, meaning the Rams are gonna be able to walk out and try another field goal. This is gonna be a tough one. I don't know if they're bringing the uh the kicking team out into the into the wind. Oh, actually, it looks like they're just bringing they're gonna, bring out. They're take the kneel the, down, kneel out the half. And they will indeed kneel it out. And the teams will go to their respective locker rooms. Texas Wesleyan, 41 to nothing, here to start this half. Damn, that was all Texas Wesleyan here to, to start this game. And uh, they get the ball to start the second half. <laughs> I see you counting up the three Yeah, I, I was yeah. trying to count up Sagu's drive. Sagu had 12 drives in that first half. They had one, two, three, four, five three and outs, three turnover on downs, a block punt that was no, that was also a three and out drive. A fumble on a I, I'm counting three and outs because they had the fumble on the fake that was punt. A three and out as well. Uh, they had one drive that they had a punt after a first down. Uh, that that's that's just not not successful. We will see what they do in the second half. Don't go anywhere. The Rams versus the Lions. Second half coming your way right here on the Sagu Sports Network. When you trust someone with your money, you're part of something greater than yourself. You're investing in a principle that it takes individuals to create a community 
that we are stronger when we support each other, that at some point, everyone will need a helping hand, that a meaningful purpose can be found in a calling. At AGC, we're banking with a purpose, so you can live for yours. When I was looking for a college to attend, I didn't just want an education, I wanted an experience. When I found SAGU, I knew I'd found a university that thrives on strong faith and solid friendships. I feel at home in my classes. I can interact with my professors and classmates because instruction is personalized. With a diverse student body, I have plenty of chances to be myself while growing with amazing people at the same time. If you're looking for much more than a college education, SAGU is for you. Racing Canes, we're huge football fans, but we're also fans of your local fundraisers and fun runs, small victories and big ideas. And yes, even the neighborhood animal shelter. I was getting to that. Plus over 30,000 other partners in the communities we serve. When you order our hand battered chicken fingers, craveable cane sauce, and jugs of freshly made tea and lemonade to cheer on your home team, you're also supporting your hometown. Racing Canes Chicken Fingers, one love. Trust someone with your money. You're part of something greater than yourself. You're investing in a principle that it takes individuals to create a community, that we are stronger when we support each other, that at some point, everyone will need a helping hand, that a meaningful purpose can be found in a calling. At AGC, we're banking with a purpose, so you can live for yours.
Sorry, have you applied to that school yet? Not really into purple. Agu, never say no to a lion. When you trust someone with your money, you're part of something greater than yourself. You're investing in a principle that it takes individuals to create a community, that we are stronger when we support each other, that at some point, everyone will need a helping hand, that a meaningful purpose can be found in a calling. At AGC, we're banking with a purpose, so you can live for yours. I wanted to finish my degree, but I didn't know where to start. My faith and family are my priorities, and I didn't see a way I could go back to school. I barely have time for myself. How would I have time to go to class? I had all but given up until a friend told me about SAGU Online. They told me I could get credit for my life experience, save thousands of dollars, and graduate early. I took a leap of faith, and now I am set to finish my degree faster than I could have imagined. I take classes that fit my schedule, and I get to learn from amazing professors who have become my friends. The Bible-based teaching has helped me grow in my faith and advance in my career. The best part is, I'm saving money and I still have time for my family. I can't wait to see what happens next. Apply now to SAGU Online and see where a degree can take you.
trust someone with your money, you're part of something greater than yourself. You're investing in a principle that it takes individuals to create a community, that we are stronger when we support each other, that at some point, everyone will need a helping hand, that a meaningful purpose can be found in a calling. At AGC, we're banking with a purpose, so you can live for yours. Raising Canes, we're huge football fans, but we're also fans of your local fundraisers and fun runs, small victories and big ideas. And yes, even the neighborhood animal shelter. I was getting to that. Plus over 30,000 other partners in the communities we serve. When you order our hand battered chicken fingers, craveable cane sauce, and jugs of freshly made tea and lemonade to cheer on your home team, you're also supporting your hometown. Raising Canes chicken fingers, one love. <laughs> injustice everywhere you feel compelled to help others to make a difference but how the answer is simple by being exactly who you are now it is time to be equipped invoke change restore hope peace justice and kindness turn your passion into compassion Here we go, it starts here, 810, take one. It's good, how are you? Good. Yeah, I mean, uh, to showcase your talents in your sport, but I think uh, SAGU uniquely gives you a family atmosphere, it gives you a community, um, it gives you a chance to grow your whole self, to your spiritual growth especially, to who you are as a man or who you are as a person. And I think that we offer um, a little bit deeper um, understanding of yourself whenever you leave. And I think that whenever they leave here, they really feel a part of something bigger than themselves. <laughs> It feels like a family, and and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else just because like how fun it is, and it's just been a really great experience. I, I've never been in a place uh, that is just loved on each other as much as the people do here at SAGU, and um, I think our guys feel it. I think I know I feel it as a coach. Uh, the people, not just in basketball, but outside of basketball, are like so selfless and actually genuinely care about you. It starts here.
I would tell students to expect to make their lifelong friends. It's not hard to find your community because SAGU is home. You can find people that either have the same passion as you or it can be completely different, but at the same time, you're able to network, but they're also gonna help you along the way too. There's such a community there, and throughout my three years at SAGU, I built so many connections, so many opportunities, and not only the students care about you, they pray for you, and they guide you to your God-given gift and your God-given talent. Community starts here. I wasn't sure about getting my master's degree online. I didn't know if I could juggle it with everything else I already had on my plate. Would I be able to find a local university that matched my values, offering the support and flexibility for my busy life? What about finances? I didn't think it was possible. Then I found SAGU. The flexibility in their programs, affordability, and biblical perspective helped me to see a way forward to fulfill my God-given calling. SAGU's support helped me create the balance I needed to succeed. Now I can pursue my degree and connect with a wide network of opportunities that will set me up for the future. Apply now and see what opportunities are waiting for you. Tired of being passed over for that promotion? Well, did you know that getting your MBA can be a great way to supercharge your professional career? Those who graduate from a two-year MBA program on average earn a starting salary of $90,000. Through SAGU's online MBA, you can earn your degree while still working at your job. And at half the cost of other two-year MBAs, there's no need to worry about the price. And you can now complete your MBA in 12, 18, or 24 months. So what's holding you back? Apply today at sagu.edu. What started for me here at SAGU was growth. I grew up in ministry, so I grew up always like thinking about people, pouring into people, and I came to the time in my life where I questioned like, God, who am I without ministry? And I didn't really know who I was in Christ. And God basically told me, I'm gonna take you through a season of growth, a season of you growing and learning about yourself. And I was like, okay, I, I'm willing to do that here where I live. And he's like, no, I'm sending you to SAGU. And I was like, what? You're sending me to a whole different city and to a school that I thought I was never gonna do. And he was like, yeah, this is what you're gonna do. And just coming to SAGU, I can truly say that I've been doing a lot of growing. I've learned who I am in Christ. And I'm so grateful for that. Opportunity starts here. Joining us, Texas Wesleyan dominates the first half and leads 41 to nothing, and they will receive the second half kickoff. Really, Tim, the story of the first half, besides everything you want to give to Texas Wesleyan, it's been this this weather, this wind. It has played a factor more so in this game than than any that I can remember in recent history. Especially in that first quarter. Uh, they took full advantage of the fact that they were, you know, pinning Sagu deep. Now, the, their defense has locked down Sagu's offense, but as far as offense goes for Texas Wesleyan, in that first quarter, they got a touchdown off a block punt, then they got the ball at the 35-yard line, didn't get a first down, and kicked a field goal. And then they got a one big touchdown pass. They threw a pick in the end zone, had a touchdown run off of another 35-yard drive, and they kicked another field goal when they didn't get a first down. So they didn't do a ton on offense, but they didn't have to. Their defense was simply that dominant, and special teams came up big. Now, they did get the one big 76-yard drive in the second quarter, so the offense has still been good, but it has not necessarily been the what you'd expect yards-wise when you're up 41 to nothing at the half. 
the story has been this suffocating defense and the heads up special teams every time they're out there on the field making field goals kicking the ball through the back of the end zone and then unfortunately for the lions really it's been the fact that even though you have a great punter uh you are always pun punting so deep so we got our first trivia question here of the day how many years did texas wesleyan not have football before restarting the program in 2017. Again, 2017 was their first year here. Shows that quick ascension to the top <coughs> of the conference. Ooh, I I, I, I remember meeting with uh, the Texas Wesleyan athletic staff uh, in a different context for, from this position uh, in, the, in the lead up to them restarting the football program. And I know I remember the year then. Uh, so I, I've got my guess in my head, and I, they, it was a long gap. It was a very long gap. I started at Sagu in 2012, and I don't believe they had a team at that point. They did not. They certainly I, – I know it's a lot longer of a gap than just a few years. I believe, to my recollection, uh, I'll give my – I don't want to throw it out there. Drop your answer in chat. Be, well, make sure and give us your answer in chat as we're getting ready for the kickoff here. And now this is interesting – the Rams are kicking off. That uh, they they get the choice to defer to the second half, and, and normal ninety nine point nine percent of the time that means that you're gonna re you're gonna kick the ball to start the game and then receive at halftime. You know what? The they Texas Wesleyan kicking choosing to kick into the wind, no, the, or, with, with the wind at their backs rather. So they're gonna force Sagu to do. I can imagine is when you defer, essentially it means you get to then choose in the second half whether you want the wind or you want the ball. And they have again decided to keep the wind at their back here in the third quarter in the hopes of, like, I guess their only thought is that the only way Saga could get back in this game is some crazy stuff with the wind. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, uh, we saw Texas Wesleyan put up how many points in the first quarter? 28 points in the first quarter. And they're forcing Sagu to relive that first <laughs> quarter here in the third quarter as the wind is still definitely a factor. Javante Gordon-West in at quarterback now for Sagu. First and 10 here. We'll turn around, hand it off. And that goes nowhere, maybe a yard, half a yard on first down. It'll be second and 10. Yeah, I'm, I'm still very – it's a very interesting decision. I, you know, it's a – it feels a little bit academic at this point already in the game, but definitely a, uh, some interesting thought going into the fact that you will not get the ball first to start either half. It worked out for them to start the game, so I think they're going to think it works out for them here in the third quarter. Uh, very rarely do you see a team elect to kick in the first quarter and the third quarter. I don't know if I've ever seen it, but here on second and nine, Gordon West. In at quarterback now. The lefty tries to throw, but it's batted away right at the line of scrimmage by Sir Hill. Brings up third and nine. And had he not deflected it, I, I think he was well covered anyways. That quick pressure. That's when being a lefty does not come in hand when, when you got the guy coming off of <laughs> yep. essentially your left side. So third and nine, Sagu obviously struggled in just about every phase of offense outside of one drive, but they certainly faced a lot of third and longs as well. Third and nine, Gordon West lets it go to Long. Long fights back for it, brings it in. That'll be a first down for Sagu. Texas Wesleyan defender asking for maybe some offensive pass interference. Uh, you get a look at it at the bottom of your screen here, and it, he doesn't push off at all. He just fights yep. back to the ball, brings it in. Yep, good job of kind of using your body and the momentum to get back there. So that time it looks like the, the kind of bit of an air ball off of the, the wind comes to Sagu's advantage. Quick adaptation gets back for the first down so I believe that's going to be their first third down conversion of the game they load it up again for long long fighting for it incomplete pushed out of bounds good coverage that time by Jay Reed has been following Jamal Long all day and has done a really good job so far good job by Long to haul it in but as we've said this is the problem when you are going with the fade routes all the time even when you make a spectacular catch like that you end up out of bounds. Second and 10 incoming here for Sagu. 
Gordon West looking the other way this time, looking into the flat, over shoots his man, Zach Fuller, leaking out into the flat. That brings up another third and long here, third and 10. That's one you've got to connect on when you do have the separation. Now Fuller's running in the wrong direction. He's not going to break that for anything big. But when you're trying to set up for a third down situation, now you're getting back at third and long. Your, your playbook is very limited. you got to connect on, though, to keep the ball moving forward if you want to keep the chains moving. Third and ten. Here is Gordon West. Back to pass. He rolls out to his left. Tries to make a man miss. He gets brought down from behind. Big loss there on third down. That'll bring up fourth and 14. And out comes the punting unit kicking into the wind where we saw such a big struggle in the first half. And we are about to witness it again here. And no one open downfield, obviously, having to flee the pocket. Gordon West is, is better on the move once he gets back there, but nowhere for the ball to go. So you have to obviously contend with the win, but obviously the Rams blocked your second punt of the game as well, so they can bring that pressure. Here is Lewis. Lewis gets it away. It's a low-line drive punt. It bounces and fielded at the 32-yard line. Bob looking to get to the outside. He's running all the way across the field, and it's going to work out for him as he picks up good yardage on the return. Goes out of bounds. We got a flag here close to the Sagu sideline. There's a flag at the far end well, and another flag. So uh, three flags on the field, and I think it's going to be a block in the back on the Rams. Now, I'm not sure why you have a flag this close to Sagu's sideline. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what that one is. The, the official kind of just dropped it at the 50-yard line. Might, we might have multiple return, penalties here. Illegal block in the back, number 32 of the return team. 10-yard penalty, first down, Texas West. So I, think the, I think the official on the near sideline just wanted to be involved a little bit <laughs> and let the flag go. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, obviously, if you see the penalty, you throw it regardless of yeah. where you are. You don't want to see anybody else has as well. But right here is where the block in the back, yeah, you'll see it. And, and completely unnecessary, obviously. The play is already over, so it takes a little bit of that nice return off the board and will give the Rams the ball at their 38-yard line. They will hand it off here on first down. Up the middle, lowers the shoulder. He's got enough for the first down. Spins forward into Sagu territory. Ashton Mitchell is having himself a great game. Unfortunately, with uh, at the moment, we have not seen Ernest Caesar the third since he left with an injury, I believe early in the second quarter is when he went out, probably that first drive of the second quarter, but Mitchell has been dominant since he stepped in. First and 10, back to pass is Rodgers. Rodgers lets it go deep down the sideline, has Bob, Bob can't quite get it. A.J. Bob, the intended receiver, flag comes out. That's a late flag. The official threw it from all the way across the field. Yeah, it came in very late. Now, he threw it to a spot on the field that wouldn't be pass interference, typically. But if it's holding, it came out awfully late. Pass interference, number one of the defense. Oh, wow. 15-yard penalty from the previous spot. Automatic first down. I'm not sure. I, saw, I, I have to get another look at it here. It's at the bottom of your screen. The ball was in the air for quite a long time, and Isaac Gowdy's not even the one in coverage. So they called it yeah. away from the play. Definitely is. definitely can't be on Isaac Gowdy. The only player in the vicinity was Jay Mosley, and I certainly didn't see him do anything at the point of contact by any means. So I, I, I am very baffled as to what that call is. And we're going to get a neutral zone infraction, maybe offsides. Yep. Offside, number four for defense with contact. Five-yard penalty, remains first down. Joseph Chavez gets called on the offsides. That'll make it first and five. And it looked like it was going to be a direct. I can't tell, actually. The ball was a direct snap to Ashton Mitchell. Now, I don't know if that was because of the contact up front that made it go off target. But at least at that moment, looked like it was actually going to be a design play direct snap to Mitchell. First and five here for the Rams. Rodgers hands it off to Mitchell. Mitchell squeezes through a hole, gets brought down a couple yards short of the first down. Gain a three, call it second and two. 
And we get to see Ernest Caesar back onto the field for the first time since coming out of the game with an injury. So it's good to see him back out there. He did walk off on his own power, uh, so it's good to see him come back out onto the field. Yep, not dealing with any larger issue. You know, come in with a second and two after Mitchell has had a very nice run of it over the last quarter. They will hand it off to Caesar. Caesar has enough for the first down, lowers his shoulder and keeps that pile moving. He needed two and he picked up five. That'll move the chains. New set of downs here for the Rams. And Zagu's sideline was irate. A pretty clear false start did not get called. You'll see right here on the replay. Yeah, oh, yeah. That, that, yep. that's about as much as a, a, a literal false start uh, by O'Brien Neely, but the flag was not thrown. Sagu sideline was screaming in, but nothing doing. First and 10 here for Texas Wesleyan from the 21-yard line. Rodgers back to pass on first down, rolls out, dumps it to the flat, incomplete. Dangerous throw, Xavier uh, Xavier Garcia was moving in on the receiver. Had he hesitated just a second, he might have had a pick there. Yeah, it, it really is the fact that he's doing it. It's one of those times where you're lucky the pass was thrown that poorly. If it had thrown a little bit more on target, he's going to have a chance to pick it off. Instead, because he's focused in on the running back, it falls harmlessly out of play. And Carson has not had to do a lot today. He does have one pick as well as the touchdown pass that he threw. But he's had a couple of dangerous ones as well. And we'll hand it off here to Caesar. Caesar weaving his way through track. If he gets to the outside, has enough for the first down and out of bounds inside the 10 yard line. That'll be first and goal from the eight. So now comes that speed factor and quickness after you've been run over. He finds the gap and immediately diverts, puts on the, wouldn't quite say the Jets, but puts on the, on, on the, quick move and gets out to the sideline. He does such a good job of finding just the smallest holes to get through and he picks up big yardage after it. He does a good job, good vision from Ernest Caesar. First and goal from the eight here for Texas Wesley. They will hand it off to Caesar on the draw, showing patience, throws a stiff arm, gets brought down at the four yard line. So pick up a four, second and goal now. Yeah, it was that patience that we saw earlier on the touchdown run that got called back. Now, he ended up getting a touchdown on that drive regardless, uh, just from a single yard out, though. Yeah, he, he does show a lot of field awareness, a lot of patience. W wouldn't quite put him at the, at the Keaton Dudick level of things because, <laughs> you know, not many people are, but, you know, that, that intelligence, that runner IQ. They hand it off again. He spins off a tackle. <laughs> that is a superhuman effort to break two tackles and, and then eventually get brought down, but wow. And, and it, he was trying to toss him to the ground right here. It's not even that it's a tackle. He's wrapped up, and that's just trying to, you know, you know, they could kind of call it the, the old uh, Reggie White hump maneuver almost. You know, you kind of throw the guy off and, and, and take him to the ground. Nothing doing from Dylan Kaufman as he stayed on his feet. Now, didn't gain any yardage afterwards, but hanging on to not go down there is quite impressive. Third and goal from the six. Caesar remains in the backfield. Back to pass. Rodgers. Let's go look into the corner of the end zone. Off the hands of his intended receiver. Pretty good ball out there intended for TJ Curtis. Just could not bring it in. So here comes the field goal unit now for the Rams. Yeah, Kaufman in coverage there. Uh, you know, did a good job of kind of staying home, you know, doing his job. But it ball still got to the receiver. And honestly, I think if Kaufman isn't kind of his hand in the way, that's probably going to be caught. Yeah, just enough. Of, that, that's where the ball isn't tipped, but you do just enough to blind the receiver that he's not quite ready for it. 23-yard field goal on the way is up, and it is good. Texas Wesleyan goes up 44 to nothing here in Waxahachie. All right, so it's time for the answer of our trivia question. Let's see if we got any guesses. My guess, I want to say 1957. I want to say it was 1957 that, that was their last year. Oh, dear. Wow. So we, okay. we got some. We got 75 years. We got 12 years. For some reason, 1957 is the date that was sticking in my head. Well, they asked how many years. So what's the uh, what's the math there? 1957, 76. 76 years. Wow, so Jared I, I, Allen. Yeah. Wow, with a with a 75 to 70. That's a, we'll go, we'll give you credit for that one. That's pretty <laughs> pretty close. So I, I was even further. I knew it had been a very long time. So I don't know where 57 was coming for, but I knew it had been a very long time. So yeah, not since. 
before World War I, as we see an update there. 20 to six, Montana to Western over Rocky Mountain at the moment. Our scoreboard will catch up soon. Evangel up by 17 on Bethany. Baker rolling all over Mid-America Nazarene. As I mentioned pregame, Baker kind of a scary team right now. They're, they're at 20, but their only losses to a top-ranked team. Watch out for them. We got an upset in the top 10 there. Friends oh, yeah. defeating Southwestern, 35 wow. to 20. A top 10 upset, wow. Wow, they kick it short here does Texas Wesleyan with the wind at their back. Alford trying to make something happen here and he's gonna get brought down just shy of the 25 yard line. Call him at the 24, that's where Sagu will take over. This point, you know, the, the main thing you look at is you see that zero right there and you got shut out against the Rams again last year. So, if you know, if anything, it's just about not laying goose eggs in back-to-back -back seasons at this point. Jamonte Gordon West remains in at quarterback. First and 10 here for Sagu from the 24-yard line. Eye formation. I, a pistol eye formation. Interesting. They give it to Rose. Rose looking to make anything happen. He's actually going to lose a yard. Brings up second and 11. Nothing I, doing in the ground game here for Sagu. I had to point it out. I miss the old eye formation sometimes. <laughs> you know what, the old days of football. Under center. Two, two stacked. A, a fullback and a running back. As you know? a guy who loves the modern <laughs> offensive system, I'm with you. I like getting under center. It gives you the opportunity for play action. I, I, like, I like the under center. I'm, I'm right there with you. I miss it. I, 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 I miss fullbacks. It, I know. The, watching the extension of the fullback has been a little sad uh, <laughs> in our lifetimes. But, you know, I mean, at this point, I guess if you're a good enough fullback, just become a tight end. Gordon West looking for Jamal Long. Long brings it in, but he is out of bounds. That makes it third and 11. Into double coverage. That was a, almost a predetermined throw from Gordon West because Long was double covered there. Yeah. And about the fourth catch that Long has made that's been pretty impressive, but falls well out of bounds. As I said, that's if that's the only place you have to go, as long as the defense is hanging with you, it's not going to work because they will easily force you out of bounds on just about every occasion. Facing pressure, Gordon West steps up and he is met and he's going to get brought down for a sack. That brings up fourth and 14. And out comes the punting unit for Sagu. Another three and out for this offense. Just unable to keep anything going. I mean, when you look back at this game at the moment, it was that, that second drive of the second quarter it was the only time we saw any consistent movement on offense with those, those quick patterns. Other than that, it has been a cacophony of three and out. Slow snap, but he gets it away, does Ryan Lewis. This is a good punt into the wind. Bob fields it in at about the 36. He's got room to run here. He's into Sagu territory, still dancing around. Takes a big hit, flag comes in from the far sideline. As it stands right now, Texas Wesleyan will take over in Sagu territory. But we'll see what the flag is here. Was a very good punt. The wind does seem to have died down a tad and maybe not coming directly across the field uh, west to east. But regardless, at his own five yard line, that was a great punt. And I do believe we're going to see a penalty on the Rams here that'll bring it back at least onto their end of the field, not in Sagu territory. During the return, you know, personal foul, illegal blindside block, number 23 of the return team. 15-yard penalty, first down to Texas Wesleyan. So it'll go back to the 36, where pretty much where it was initially fielded. So it is a the long punt does pay off for Ryan Lewis this time. Turns into a 44-yard punt from Ryan Lewis. Texas Wesleyan will take over at their own 36-yard line. Leading 44 to nothing does Texas Wesleyan. Under seven to play here in the third quarter. Rogers will hand it off. Here is Mitchell. Mitchell spun down after no gain. Call it no gain there on first down. Makes it second and 10. 
They go back to Mitchell, who has been the workhorse for the, I wouldn't say quite the majority of this game, but at least for the at least for the majority of the game where they've had to have long drives, you know, on their end of the field, has been their go-to guy. Second and ten incoming here for Rodgers and his Rams offense. Rodgers, back to pass, facing pressure. Let's it go off his back foot. Incomplete. Lontarius McLean tried to make a play on the ball, but falls incomplete. There's a flag in the middle of the field. It is. I'm wondering what it looks like. It could be in the area of defensive holding, but we'll see. Typically, when that back judge throws it there, that's what you're looking at. No one seems to be moving. No one seems to be aware that there's a flag. <laughs> I'm not sure the officials are aware there's a flag. We got the call incoming here. It's going to go against Texas Wesleyan. Yeah, Sagu, because they're asking Sagu whether they want to decline it or not. So probably, I would imagine maybe a hold on, on the offensive line at that point. I'm not sure if you would There's decline no foul it or not. For intentional grounding. There was a player in the area. However, there is a foul. Ineligible receiver down field. Number 60 in oh. the offense. Five yard penalty. Remain second down. See, I was so blatantly not intentional grounding that I didn't even know intentional grounding was in the conversation. Right, I'd say, yeah, I got, okay, there was clearly a receiver trilling. Now, it was not going to be caught by anyone, and technically the closest receiver was a Sagu defender, but you did have a receiver rushing towards the ball, even though he was well away from it. So, yeah, I definitely wasn't considering hmm. intentional grounding. So, Sagu will accept the illegal man downfield penalty to bring up second and 15 versus third and 10. Second and 15 incoming here for Rodgers in this Rams offense. Three wide to his left. He's back to pass. Let's it go across the middle of the field. It's oh. almost intercepted. Xavier Garcia had his hands on it, and it just went right through his fingertips. Perfectly red, just could not finish the play. That's the second for Garcia. He, he's, yeah, you can see him really thinking about that one. Second one that he's had in his hands today that he could not haul in. And more risky throws from Carson Rogers. And that one really should have been picked right there. Third and 15 incoming here for Texas Wesleyan. Ball, ball is on the ground, but it's picked up by Mitchell, but he's brought down quickly. I'm not sure what the plan was there. I think it might have just been hit as it was snapped. I think, I, I think it might have caught a man in motion is all I can see because it never got back to the quarterback. Rogers just started retreating from the scene as quickly as possible. We'll see it here. No, there's no man in motion. I don't. I think he just went I, off the leg yep. of the center. Just I, I couldn't tell if the running back was moving forward beforehand. Nope, not at all. Not running a third and 15 fumble ruski, I don't think. <laughs> That'll result in a three and out here for Texas Wesleyan. And they are back to punt. Daniel Trejo gets it away, and it is a beautiful spiraling punt fielded by Gowdy. Gowdy muffs it and then falls on it. Pretty good punt there from Trejo from the 25 all the way down to the 23. So definitely flips the field position. 52-yard punt. And this is where you start looking at how Sagu's defense has performed in this game. And it sounds almost laughable to say that they've done a really good job in a game that they are trailing 44 to nothing. But there have only been five drives that the Rams have started on their end of the field. Those five drives have resulted in three three and outs, a touchdown drive, and a field goal. That's just a normal day that for, for an offense this good. That's what you would expect. End around here to Alford, and that is going nowhere. Sagu cannot do anything on offense, even though they, they dial up some trickery, and Texas Wesleyan is right there dropping them for a loss. But, yeah, I mean, it, so in a normal straight-up, square-up football game where you're starting on your end of the field like you really should be on the majority of drives, Sagu's defense has given up 10 points. They've dropped a couple of picks. They've had an interception in the end zone. The... The other 34 points of damage have all come either directly off of special teams or on very, very abbreviated fields of 35 yards or shorter. Sagu switches the receivers on the outside. Here's Gordon West on second and 14. Back to throw. Evades pressure, rolling out to his left. Still looking for someone. He's going to get hit and brought down for a loss of one. So credit as a sack. It'll be third and 15. Just nothing doing there for Sagu. There's nothing open downfield for, for Gordon West. And right there, you got 
kind of a bad route situation. Two guys stacked right on top of each other. That essentially is like, you know, sitting out on the back patio. The mosquitoes are going to know where to come and find you. There's four different defenders all in that vicinity, and that's where he was looking for. Somebody needs to break in a different direction there. Third and 16 here for Sagu, looking to avoid going three and out for the second consecutive drive here in the, th in the third quarter. Gordon West, back to pass, facing pressure. Let's go across the middle, has Odidi. Odidi cuts up field, but is brought down well short of the first down marker. And that will bring out the punting unit for Sagu. Another three and out here for the Lions. It's been about the third or fourth time that they have actually made something happen on third down, found Odidi or, or someone at least over the middle for a nice chunk gain, but they've dug themselves into so many third and very long holes that, you know, 10, 12, 13 yards, usually exactly what you want to see on third down, isn't enough to get you even close to out of it. The Rams look like they're bringing pressure, and they do. Here's Lewis, gets it away. Spiraling punt hits at the 49 and takes a Sagu bounce to the 41 yard line of Texas Wesleyan. Now this is from two weeks ago. This was an absolutely spectacular catch from Jamal Long, and we had pulled folks on social media, TikTok and Instagram, about this using our poll function, which was better, the catch or the stiff arm? We got very similar numbers here. Honestly, I, I got to say, stiff arm is too high on that. <laughs> I got to say, <laughs> oh, yeah. the stiff oh, arm is yeah. nice. It's nice, but, I mean, that catch was something else. So, so if, if you are with me and you think that the stiff arm is a little too high on those polls, be sure and check us out on our social media platforms like Instagram and TikTok uh, and give in a vote when we give you the opportunity there. As you see, a play quickly dragged down. A flag does come in. Looking at holding here, I believe. Yeah, they're asking Sagu what they want to do. So yeah, I don't want to disparage our social media followers, but when I'm seeing a catch like that and I'm seeing a full quarter of the audience say, oh, the stiff arm was better. I'm like, hey, the stiff arm was great. I'm not disputing that. But that one-handed grab when he had to kind of tap it down to himself and still corral it essentially with one hand, uh, that, that was just about unbeatable in my mind. First and 20. Back to pass, lets it go to the flat, has his man fighting down to the 40-yard line. That is T.J. Curtis. Curtis was the one who had that spectacular catch down to the goal line himself. Uh, just uh, Looks like we have the end of a, the first half. a new quarterback into the game here for Texas Wesleyan, oh. Cole Francis. Had totally missed that. First pass attempt of the day, the 6'4 redshirt freshman getting his first action of the afternoon here for Texas Wesleyan. So a good performance by Carson Rogers. It looks like he's going to get the rest of the day off, barring anything crazy. Francis back to pass, completes it down at the 50-yard line. They pick up that 20 yards in two plays, and they still don't sniff a third down, Tim. That is just so impressive by this Rams offense. It'd be very interesting when you actually break down the stats when they're over, actually. As impressive as they've been, they have, as we talked about in pregame, have really struggled on third downs, and they've struggled today. When they've gotten to them, Sagu's defense, more often than not, has gotten them off the field. Their success is when they beat you on first and second down and don't even have to get in that situation, which they have done enough today, obviously, on offense to counter what their uh, special teams and defense have done. Francis going through his progressions, looking for his man. It's fought for and brought oh, wow. in. What a catch on the outside by TJ Curtis. Was fighting with Lontarius McLean, and he comes down with it. This, take a look. This is incredible. What a catch. That's not an easy battle going against McLean. And at first, I thought McLean was the one with pole position, especially since he had the vantage point of going to wow. the ground. Great job to hang on to that one. And he knows it. He gets up with a little bit of a little bit of swag in his step. That's a nice little catch by TJ Curtis. Moves the chains here for Texas Wesleyan. Fake pitch. Swings it out to his man in the flat, and he's upended. Good tackle on the outside by McLean. That time Caleb McKinney on the reception. Good job by McLean. He's kind of getting blocked downfield. Quick response to get back into the play. Up in the the, the the short man on the pass tree pass route tree there. So under 30 seconds to play here 
in the third quarter. Francis facing a second and eight. We'll hand it off to Mitchell. Mitchell cuts up field, keeps his feet, lowers the shoulder. He's going to get forward progress just about a yard shy of the first down marker. That should bring up third and one and should flip the field here as the teams will switch sides as we have reached the end of quarter number three. Texas Wesleyan leading 44-0 here in this ball game. A ball game where they did all of their damage in the first quarter. I just counted up. They had seven drives in the first quarter. The Rams, they are on their sixth drive of the second and third quarter combined since then. It's all about that first quarter. Hey, Tim, you know what's pretty good this year? Saigu women's soccer. And uh, they've got a, if I may say, an absolute stud in the leading goal scorer in the conference, Anna Bewley. 20 total goals this season, five ahead of second place in the conference. This absolutely has been going off this year. Um, she had hat tricks in both the games last weekend against OPSU and Wayland Baptist. If you're not familiar with hockey terms, three goals in each game. That's six over two. That's absolutely incredible. Was awarded the Student Athletic Conference and NAIA Offensive Player of the Week last week. And we were checking our notes. I believe that's the first time that has happened in Sagu women's soccer history that we've had the Student Athletic Conference and, and NAIA Player of the Week. And we watched that goal right there earlier in pregame. That is such spectacular control to get that literally wedge in between the and goalkeeper's hands and the top goal ball, top post, essentially. That goal right there is one of the all-time greats. Absolutely and, spectacular. And when I said the, the two hat tricks against OPSU and Wayland Baptist, she decided to mess around and make it three in a row. Four yeah. goals against Arlington Baptist this past Tuesday, yeah. and they are undefeated in conference, 3-0, and 8-2-1 and two and one overall, and it's just been very good. Zoe Bolt as well, goalkeeper, the senior, leads a conference in goals against with just seven and only two goals given up in Sooner Athletic Conference play. Back to action here in Waxahachie. Texas Wesleyan on third down. They try to stretch it to the outside and get nothing. Nothing. It brings yeah. it fourth and short. This is the first really fourth down situation they've had to make a decision on in terms of go for it or field goal here today. And what amazing pursuit right there from Xavier Garcia. Defending a third and one does a great job of getting outside and pulling the running back down well short of the first down marker. And the Rams are going to stay on the field. They're not going to attempt the field goal into the wind. Fourth and one incoming for the Rams. They will hand it off. Here is Caesar. Caesar throws a stiff arm, tries Nowhere. to cut it back. Nothing doing, and that is a turnover on downs for Sagu's defense, and they will get the ball back on the 31-yard line. So a turnover on downs forced by the Sagu defense, and <laughs> With grass behind them, they continue to excel and, and not let the Rams get into the end zone. It's just so unfortunate for, for Sagu the way that the, the game has gone, that it got so out of hand so quickly with those mistakes in deep inside their own territory. And that, that has led to where just about everything else they've tried to do, everything else they have accomplished on defense just hasn't mustered much. Gordon West on first down looking for Aaron Thomas. Falls incomplete. Looking for him out in the flat. A little bit too much on it. Brings up second and ten. And again, for the Lions, it, it it's a race against the clock right now to avoid the shutout. You, you lost 35 to nothing last year. Trailing 44 to nothing right now. Uh, man, you would hate to go into 2024 knowing there's eight quarters of utter futility behind you against your rival down the highway. The second and long run goes nowhere. In fact, it leads to a loss of three, making it third and 13. Third and 13 coming up. And I think the Rams know where pretty much your only outlet is. Third and 13 incoming here for Gordon West, looking to avoid their third straight three and out here backed up in their own territory. And they will hand it off here on third and 13. That goes nowhere. A gain of just one Raphael. makes it fourth and 12. Raphael Bell in the game. It's worth a noting. I think a late flag just came in. Did I see? 
I thought maybe. I thought maybe I saw something. I saw an official do but, something. <laughs> and, and it could have been any one of the Rams' yellow shoes. That kind of throws you off yeah, sometimes. True. <laughs> you, 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 you catch that foot out of the corner of your eye, and you wait a second. I was watching our monitor, saw something out of the corner of my eye, but it turns out it was nothing. Just going crazy. Uh, but it's worth noting that on that drive, Sagu had put in all of their backups yeah. as well, which, as well as having a game that's completely out of hand, giving them some playing time, I think can clearly be seen as a message from Coach Ellis to his starters. A good punt. Here is Bob. Bob into the open field. He's down to the 40. Can he make Quavion Mitchell, Mitchell miss? He cannot. He drives him out of bounds. There is a flag back where the punter, uh, Ryan Lewis, let go of the ball. But what a return by A.J. Bob. As it stands, he's got a really good return into Sagu territory. Well, we'll, we'll see what the call right is here. here. Personal foul. And Roughing the kicker, number four. Oh, wow. The defense hitting flat leg. 15-yard penalty. Automatic first down. And it wasn't much at all, and it truly was just a bump into the plant leg, as we saw in the replay there. What a job by Quavion Mitchell, though, to, <laughs> to, to save what was looking like it was going to be a, a touchdown. Now, it was all erased anyways because of the roughing the kicker call. And again, that's one of those situations where it doesn't matter about how hard you hit him or how aggressive you are. They are very careful about you rolling into that plant leg. So Sagu given new life. Uh, on that drive, it will not be a three and out, exclusively thanks to a roughing the kicker call. Here is Gordon West, back to pass, looking across the middle, almost intercepted through the hands of the defensive back for the Rams. Number 25 in coverage, Nick Williams, the freshman, had it, could not bring it in. And he's, he's upset with himself. And it was hard to tell if Colby Tanner lost track of where the ball was. He kind of gave up on the route. As he is pretty much the only starter in the game right now for the Lions. No, I take, I take that back. I believe... No, they've brought in Robert McGrew Jr. at running back now. Second and ten. Gordon West. We'll hand it off on second and 10, and he cuts it upfield. He's finally got enough for a just shy of the first down. Their first positive running play of the game, I believe, Tim. They've been shut down all day long. Yeah, they, they've gained some yards here and there, but that's got to be the first time that they've gained more than three. Uh, and it brings up a third and two, a, a, a rarity here for Sagu. And now into the game at quarterback for the Lions is Jacob Doolittle. Jacob Doolittle, junior and, junior and, quarterback. And I honestly can't tell you when he stepped into the game. <laughs> he just came in. Just came yeah, in on Gordon this West play. Handed it off. He came off the field here on third and two. They bring in the junior. So Doolittle into the game. He's got McGrew behind him facing this third and two at the 49-yard line. And the ball is bobbled. It's up in the air. Texas Wesleyan has it. Open field in front of him, and look at him go. Down to the 10, into the end zone. A play that was busted from the snap. Results in a 49-yard scoop and score for Texas Wesleyan. That is number 16, Jay Reed, picking up the ball and taking it all the way home and pending an extra point. Texas Wesleyan looks to go up 51 to nothing. A little bit of a high snap, but Jacob Doolittle palms it down. And right here, yeah, he's not, never, just never able to bring it into his body. And that was done the moment it hit the defender's hands. Extra point is up and good. And call it half a hundo plus one, 51 to nothing for the Rams over Sagu. Their second defensive slash special teams touchdown of the game. A game that, 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 that that's the story of how they have completely dominated here. As I mentioned a while ago, Sagu's defense, when given a field to play with, when given a chance, you know, with the ball in opposition territory, They've only got 10 points. All right, trivia question. After attending Texas Wesleyan, MLB Hall of Famer, Tris Speaker, that's the name I actually recognize, went on to amass 3,514 hits. How high does that rank in MLB history? But Adam, you're a bit of a baseball dude, as in it's your favorite thing. My favorite thing? Uh, you, you, you're, you're a baseball guy. I, I would call you a baseball guy. Uh, what was it, uh, 3,514? 3, I know it's not top three. 
because number three, I think, is like 37-71. See? I told you you're a baseball guy. <laughs> uh, Ball's I don't want to be wrong here. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to say, I, I've, I've hyped you up. <laughs> Colby Tanner takes the, the uh, kickoff just shy of the 30-yard line. 3,514. I, mean, I want to put it at number six. Number six. Okay. Because I, I know that, obviously, 3,000 is the mark you want to hit. And it is fifth all time. Fifth. Ah, man. Just 49 hits. You know hits what? Jeter's six. Ahead of Derek Jeter. That's right. You know what? I was close. I knew, ah, oh, man, I'm upset with myself. I'm not happy about that. <laughs> hey, you that. know what, that, that's close. Hey, you know, a uh, li li little brag one with myself is another fumble here for the Lions. Uh, speaking of, you know, Coach Ellis a moment ago, uh, have you played uh, the uh, the immaculate gridiron game where you have to match football players with the Tim, trivia? I, I play immaculate grid baseball, <laughs> football, and basketball. I play that almost every day. Well, I was super hyped. I think it was... <laughs> Tuesday morning, I woke up, and the bottom right corner was Pro Bowler and Dallas Cowboys. And I'm like, well, obviously, there's the obvious answers. But I know of a dude I get to talk to every Saturday <laughs> who made a Pro Bowl. I punched that in. I was disappointed with my fellow Cowboys fans that Greg Ellis was only receiving .03% so of the, the selections. I, I had to bump those numbers up for him. On third, on second down, incomplete pass intended for Colby Tanner. The goal, t the goal, Tim, is to get the lowest score possible mm -hmm. on the Immaculate Grid. So that, that props to you. I oh, think yeah. The, I, I, I had a feeling, you know, I'm sure lots of people just threw in Troy Aitman and called it a day. But it's like, let's uh, – let's Let's think deep here, so <laughs> I, I often get wrong because I get way too cute, and I try to guess somebody that is not uh, actually fitting in of the uh, of the odds. There, Sagu completely thrown for a loss there, and that's going to bring up fourth and call it probably 17, 18. Another three and out here for Sagu. The last drive actually broke their string of three and outs, but only thanks to a roughing the punter penalty. They did not pick up a first down through actual gameplay. That is their only first down of the half, that roughing the kicker penalty. Uh, their only first down of their last six drives. It'll be a delay of game here on the Lions. Oh, they actually got they got a timeout in just in time, so the ball, it'll remain fourth and seventeen at the twenty-two yard line. So yeah, Tris Speaker, former Ram. I, I I don't think you understand how fired up I am to get a baseball trivia question <laughs> on on, a, on our on our broadcast today. So we talked about the, the Lady Lions soccer team. Tim, let's talk about the men's soccer team. Also having a nice little season on their own. They're 3-1 in conference, 9-3 and three overall. They play the number one team in the country today in Mac U. That is at 8.30 p.m. tonight under the lights, Saturday night lights for the soccer team. you got to love to see that. Uh, they actually have the leading goal scorer in the conference, Ethan Stewart, with 12 I, I, it, when you got the leading goal scorer, you got a chance, especially yeah. against the number one team. So keep an eye on that one tonight. It's going to be it's going to be a, an interesting watch here for the men's soccer team. And how about that on the pitch for both the Lady Lions and the Men Lions, being the teams with the leading goal scorers on both sides of, of that conference talk. And again, with that beautiful, beautiful new stadium out there where they are playing that yep. new field. Not quite a stadium yet, but the new field. <laughs> Uh, what a great roll here from there Ryan we Lewis. Go. From Has Ryan Lewis to the 20, from the 22 to the 17. Beautiful punt from Ryan Lewis. Has hopefully at least evened out his averages from that disastrous first quarter. Yeah, that that's a big one tonight. Going to take Mac U. And we saw just a moment ago with kind of the Mac U triple header. Lady Lions volleyball did hang on. I say hang on. They they swept <laughs> it, the Lady of Angels I'll uh, tell three you, zip. The, the Lady Lions they've got a lot of big games coming up here this week. It's yeah. Might might talk about them in a second. It's crunch time because there, there there's a certain someone who on that team who is very close to an all time landmark. We'll talk about that one here in just a second as the Rams take over. Got to be for the first time inside the round 20, center, right? Tim, you got your under center formation. Francis fakes the handoff. Out, rolling to his right. Let's it go. And it is incomplete. Just shy of his intended receiver that time uh, in 
in the middle of the field. That was Christopher S. Doyle. And as, as I was saying a second ago, this has got to be the first time in this game, as we talk about facing a longer field, the first time that they've been inside their own 20 to start a drive. Second and 10 here for Francis, back into the shotgun. One receiver either side, he's going to hand it off here on second down, cutting it up field, keeping the feet moving. And he's got, call it six on second down, make it third and four. Still going is Ashton Mitchell. And he, he strikes me as one of these guys, we're not gonna you know see that you know, really gut check today, but one of those running backs to get stronger as the game goes on. And it's not that he gets stronger, and it's more that you are worn down, and he is not worn down nearly as much as you are, because he is still looking just as impressive on these runs midway through the fourth quarter as he looked early in the game. Francis, play action, back to pass, gets it out into the flat, and he's got his man enough for the first down. Finds his uh, receiver out in the flat, Caleb McKinney. And we've seen really good play from Cole Francis. Uh, I mean, it's hard to judge at this point in the game, but he's honestly thrown a better ball today than what we saw. It's almost for the it's most a different part. offense. He gets yeah. a lot of moving pieces with Francis. I don't want to say he looks more traditional in terms of being a passer, but it looks they've got look they've got a completely different offense installed for Francis. Mm -hmm. He'll turn around and hand it off here, Mitchell. On first down, picks up four, make it second and six. Yeah, he, he's had some good zip on some of these passes. Obviously, you know, I don't think there's any quarterback controversy. Carson Rogers has done a great job, but and he had he didn't have to do much today. He he knew what he had to do, but he threw a pick, had a couple of more that were nearly intercepted. Uh, so you know, for the Rams, it's more just a good thing to know that you do have another guy right there, a red shirt freshman who's already looking this good. Second and six, Francis under center, turns around, hands it off, Mitchell. Mitchell looking to get to the outside, throws a stiff arm. He picks up just enough to move the chains. That's a good run, just got to the outside and lowered his shoulder, picked up, needed six, got six and a half. They haven't moved him yet, now they're moving forward. It took him a second to, to totally deduce whether they were gonna put him. He does pick up the first down, and they keep moving after starting this drive at their own 16-yard line. Have now moved up to the 44-yard line as we cross the halfway marker of the fourth quarter. Rams content to keep this one on the ground and kind of keep that clock moving. On first down, picks up maybe half a yard. They'll probably call it second and nine. So for the Rams, who oh, we have a injured player down. Timeout. Injured offensive player. Yep. So we teased it a second ago with the Lady Lions win today over Mac U. That's the number four team of the conference, by the way, with an easy sweep. The team is currently ranked number 24 overall in the NAIA. They're just trailing the Lady Rams, who they lost to earlier this year. Uh, if they win out and they sweep Texas Wesleyan at home on October 24th, they would win back-to-back -back Student Athletic Conference championships. So October 24th is a huge day. And now you know what else is going to be a huge day next Friday night uh, against John Brown because Coach Hank Moore, with the win today, is sitting at 499 career wins. If he wins on Friday night, he will punch win number 500 all time. Coach Hank Moore, uh, the model of consistency year in and year out. Uh, they have always, from back in the you know Red River days, even before the Red River days. I remember you know you know back in 2000, 2001 when they were you know competing at even a, a smaller level has always kept a consistently good team. And he's had more than just a good team the last two years. He has had a great team. Obviously, the undefeated run last year to the national tournament. I mean, you, you've called this team for years as well. You, you know oh, yeah, exactly absolutely. what kind of coach he is. And, you know. I, got, I, have, I have a soft spot for, for yeah. Coach Moore. He was my, if you're familiar with SAGU curriculum at all, he was my S3 teacher <laughs> my first year at, uh, at SAGU and really helped me out a lot to get involved in life on, uh, on, on campus uh, and actually convinced me to 
go ahead and start things with the Sagu Sports Network. So I would not be calling games if it was not for Coach Moore. So a soft spot for Coach So 500 wins and play-by-play -play man Adam Ferguson. The two oh, biggest impacts. No, 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 no. We're not going to go that far. Um, no, no, no. We're a not couple go of that. banners, a couple of rings, <laughs> and he's responsible for Adam Ferguson no, calling no, games. No, no. We're not that's, going that that's far. A <laughs> Second and one here for Texas Wesleyan. Dance around the backfield. Jet gets upfield. Has enough for the first down. That's a new running back into the game for Texas Wesleyan. Uh, on, our, on our on our on our list, it's a quarterback, Josue Preza. It's that time of game, folks. We are officially at the parts of the uh, of the two deep in the roster that things aren't making sense anymore. That'll be a new set of downs here for Texas Wesleyan. We can ask whoever caught your uh, lineup card that flew out of the booth around five oh, it's minutes ago. Oh, going to say the same thing as the one I have here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a windy day here in Waxahachie. Back to pass is Francis. He's going to load it up and go deep. He's got a man open, underthrown, maybe into the wind a little bit. His intended receiver was Michael Banks. And Ronnie Murphy with great defense there, staying with him step by step and batting that ball away. As he goes through his read progression. Goes for the good option, and that's one of those times that, again, you talk about the wind all day today. Had he had the wind at his back, that's probably dropping right into Michael Banks' hands for, if not a touchdown, a huge catch. Instead, it falls just a bit short and gets deflected away. Second and ten here, and they will hand it off. Cuts upfield, throws a man off, tries to keep the pile moving. He's going to pick up three on second and ten, make it third and seven. So another third down situation. Again, the only places, as we mentioned pregame, the only places they've struggled is red zone offense and third downs. They've continued to struggle on that today, and it just hasn't mattered a single bit. Third and seven incoming here for Texas Wesleyan. We approach five minutes left to go in the fourth quarter. Cole Francis will just hand or fake the hand or give it off to Perez. I, I got fooled there for a second. I thought for sure they'd be throwing it on third down. Loses his footing, fourth and seven. We'll sway Preza might have had an edge to the outside, but just could not keep his footing. And they will come out and punt here. Daniel Trejo on the punt. Another stand by the Sagu defense. As Barring any uh, anything sudden here in the last five minutes, here in the second half, they have only allowed three points on five drives. Now some of that with, with the backups in, obviously, and the Rams obviously not dialing up an aggressive offense looking to get tons more points. Trejo going to kick it into the wind. It's going to bounce at the seven, and a beautiful job. Daniel Trejo pinning Sagu at the seven-yard line. He's done a really good job today. Limited, limited work for Trejo, but a really good job here today. We'll be right back here next Saturday as Sagu will be looking for the bounce back win against North American University. They'll have their chance to, to try to shake this one off. For the Rams, this will keep them undefeated in the conference. And you, you hate to start looking ahead already because anybody can, can get you any week. But you start looking at the fact that Louisiana Christian is also undefeated and rising in the ranks and looking really good. Now, they still have to play Ottawa, Arizona. Yep. Uh, but depending on how that goes... At the moment, well, I'd say at the moment, uh, this is where the schedule will go. It just depends on what the stakes are. The Rams and Wildcats will play in Fort Worth the final week of the season. That's going to no, be a big November game. November 11th. And so, honestly, no matter what, no matter what, it will uh, almost certainly be a game that will determine the course of of the Sooner Athletic Conference. Now the question is, will it be creating a three-team tie type situation if if the Wildcats were to lose one? Or could it be, the thing I love to say, the <laughs> de facto Sooner Athletic Conference championship game? We don't play a championship game in the conference, but truly the championship game. Two undefeated teams going head-to-head. -head. Winner is the 
unquestioned, unchallenged conference champion. After last year, I feel like we need a good <laughs> We had the chance of like the five, six team tie at one point last year. We'll still see though, I, you know, it's still mid-October. We got a long ways to go. A lot could change. A lot of upsets any given week. Zagu, of course, has to play the, the Wildcats, and then they'll hopefully try to find a way to get it going before then. But you could easily see. Illegal chalk block, number 64 and 65. Half the distance to the goal. Replay third down. Well, on first down here for Sagu, they had a nice little eight-yard pitch and catch from uh, – Jamonte Gordon West to Justin Bodie on, but ever since then they've been moving backwards, have not been able to pick up any yardage, and now it makes it third and nine. So we'll definitely keep an eye on that one. We'll be broadcasting that day, so we we may be keeping tabs on that game. Scoreboard as well. watching, that's always fun to do. Although we'll also have homecoming and senior day that day. So that's we'll a big have, day. We'll have our hands <laughs> full on November 11th, uh, the final game of the year. They will hand it off here, and that was a little bit busted, and nothing doing there. Make it third and maybe 11, or fourth and 11 here. As we are most likely before this snap, gonna hit under two minutes to play in the fourth quarter. It's Ryan Lewis is on to punt, and as it stands, it looks like Texas Wesleyan will shut out Sagu for the second consecutive season up 51 to nothing and will have possession with two minutes left. A rough day at the yard for Sagu. Uh, on offense, it's going to be nigh on impossible to find a single silver lining. On defense, uh, it doesn't take much at all as the ball is loose. There was your last gasp chance to maybe, just maybe, get some points on the board. Well, they wouldn't have been able they to advance, the, advance ball anyway. the ball. Uh, 41 yard uh, field maybe would have had a slight shot. On defense, you don't have to look hard at all. As I already said, uh, they have allowed, when the Rams have started on their end of the field, they have allowed 10 points. They had an interception in the end zone, they had a number of big sacks. 14 points of these 51 got scored on defensive special teams. Another two touchdowns came off of insanely short drives. Two of the field goals came off of drives where the Rams did not have to pick up a single yard in order to kick the field goal. Defense, uh, the, the silver linings are obvious. They don't seem obvious in a game you lose 51 to nothing, but they're there. On offense, the Lions have just got to find any way of making things work. There's that one drive, the one drive that they dialed things up and were running quick hitches the whole way down the field. The only time they crossed midfield so you see some Sagu Lady Lions highlights. Oh yeah, be sure and follow us on social media for the Sa Sagu Sports update throughout the week. The Sagu students recap the latest news, highlights, and more from the world of Sagu athletics. So if you can't catch the games live, you can catch the recaps. Uh, you can follow them on Facebook and describe, subscribe on YouTube. Those, they, Sagu, those Sagu Sports Network updates, they're fun of our very own Kiara D'Amato does those yep. weekly, and it's very it's very fun to watch. I, I love it. I, I You know, doing these football games, I don't always get to keep up with the games that are happening throughout the week, and it really helps me you know, figure out what's going on, and it's always nice to keep updated with for, these, for, these other teams. For those of you uh, older folks, it's like what Sports Center used to be. What's Sports Center nowadays, Tim? 49 minutes of screaming <laughs> at each other and two Yankees highlights. <laughs> oh, man. We are under 30 seconds left to play in this one, and uh, Texas Wesleyan has to run one more play, and that will do it. Uh, and unless anything crazy happens here, they will just hand it off, cut back upfield, and he will get brought down. And that will do it. As the teams get ready to meet at midfield for some handshakes, hand pounds, high fives, whatever you're gonna call it, Texas Wesleyan going to feel very, very good about heading back on their bus up 287 north about 30 minutes with a 51 to nothing win over their rival Sagu Lions. And a game that really everything you need to know about it happened in the first really nine to ten minutes of gameplay at that point was when the Rams had a 25 to nothing lead they made it 28 nothing shortly after 
Again, 28 points in that first quarter, and from that point on, it was just kind of holding things in place, enforcing their will. Uh, complete dominance on defense and special teams, and the offense does just enough. You know, they, they came in with, you know, typically you ask your defense to do mop-up duty. It was the offense who did mop-up duty today as they roll to a 51 to nothing win. Stay undefeated in conference, five and one overall, and stay right there as the team to beat when it comes to the Sooner Athletic Conference Championship. They were my picks at the beginning of the year, it was Texas Wesleyan. They just, uh, they get better year after year, and I think this year might be their year. But honestly, Tim, who would have thought Louisiana Christian would come in firing like they have been? Now, you said, like you said, they still have to play Texas Wesleyan and Ottawa of Arizona. They have had a little bit of an easier start to the to the season. Not that any Sooner Athletic Conference game can be viewed as easy, uh, but you know, sitting there at 13, they got to feel pretty good. I'm still sticking with Texas Wesleyan after what we saw today. Just pure dominance on both sides of the ball. They look like they are the most complete team that we have seen so far in the conference. Um, and it's just they just look really good, really, really good. So again, your final score today, 51 to nothing. Upcoming broadcasts here on the Sagu Sports Network. We talked about it earlier, Friday, October 20th at 6 p.m., the Lady Lions volleyball team take on John Brown for Coach Moore's, Coach Hank Moore's potential 500th career win. So you're definitely going to want to tune in to see that. Not only, is it a, not only is it for his 500th win, John Brown's a pretty good conference opponent, too. This has positioning on the line here for the Sooner Athletic Conference. Volleyball standings. Third, third in the standings right now, so it's not like this is some cakewalk for them. And then Saturday, October 21st at 1 p.m., the next day, volleyball takes on Oklahoma City. The Stars, the Lady Stars, and another big, another powerhouse team in the Sooner Athletic Conference. So it does not get any easier here for the Lady Lions. And then, of course, uh, Saturday, October 21st, one hour after that, the kickoff between Sagu and the North American University. It's going to be a good one. Uh, it, they're, a, they're a team that are that are looking to get their feet into the Student Athletic Conference, and Sagu needs a bounce-back win, so what better to face a first-year first, team, first, a first -year team program here in North American University. So definitely want to tune in for that one here on the Sagu Sports Network. All of our upcoming broadcasts will be on the Sagu Sports Network YouTube channel. Share the link with your family and friends so they can keep up to date with Sagu Sports Network action. You can find our past broadcasts, highlights, shorts, and more on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Pretty much any social media outlet that you can find. We are on. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Whatever it is nowadays on each of these social media platforms. Final score again, the Texas Wesleyan Rams 51, the Sagu Lions nothing. Uh, today's broadcast was brought to you by 90% of our student crew, 90% of our crew being students here at SAGU, and we thank them immensely for the time that they take out of their weekends and their studying and their homework to bring you these broadcasts. We are very appreciative of what they do to bring you the best broadcast that we possibly can. I'm Adam Ferguson right now with Tim Roberts and behalf of our entire crew so long from Waxahachie, Texas, and thank you for watching the SAGU Sports Network. Thank you.